I got to go back and watch all those. Mm-hmm. I know they just did the third one. Oh, we were just talking about Hal Hartley movies. since Bennington. Uh, and that was a little band I like to call The Who. And then have an arrow going straight up in the air. The Who. You all part of them. Yeah. All part of Mod Week. Mm-hmm. Mod Week. Uh, there's Gail Bennington right there. How Hi. are you, Gail? Hi. I'm doing well. Uh, one of your heroes on the program today, um, this was a hero of yours since you were a little girl, although I've learned in the past never to point that out to people. <laughs> you know, I mean? People always hate it when you go, when I was three years old. <laughs> I was a baby and you were not. <laughs> you were, oh God, I guess you were your, uh, but people, I, I've learned that over the years. Right. I've done it enough. I've made enough uncomfortable those moments but this uh actress there was a time i think that you based yourself on her a little bit uh absolutely or at least did impressions of her all day that's right the one and only parker posey obsessed who, with her uh in our minds uh has been is and shall be a queen she is indie queen but queen of all when did uh, when did we even stop talking about indie as if it were all together at the same time? It's been a while. Yeah, I think uh, you know it had its like heyday, a pretty long run, and then I think that just like dropped out of favor. Don't you think? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, if you go to Sundance now, you know Jennifer Aniston is there. One thing that still. In you know, I think documentary st- film still feels independent and weird and on the outside. But you can't, you know, the fact that Jennifer Aniston doesn't wear makeup and, you know, gain five pounds, it doesn't excite me. Right. Not that there's, you know, I'm not attacking her, but I'm just saying it's, sh- you're already established. It should be something different. But if you go back to the, well, look at the, um, in the early 90s, of how many people that weren't stars at the time that we thought were stars. Yeah. Like Buscemi, and that list went on and on, you know? Yeah, and I think also, I mean, if you look at the last couple years, even if you look at the Independent Spirit Awards, like, when did that change? Like, was that a slow progression? Because now it's, doesn't it seem like they have completely changed what they view as an independent film? Yeah, they well, first of all, they they now say if it's under 20 million, you're an independent film. But the fact that you sit there in front of all these corporate logos to give these out, you know? Right, doesn't seem so independent. (laughs) Right, and you just um, it it honestly looks exactly like the Oscars, and it's the day before, except for everyone wears jeans. (laughs) <laughs> right. That's the cool independent thing. We like that we can wear sneakers to this if we want. And say, fuck, but it still gets bleeped out as it gets played <laughs> 10 hours later on IFC. By the way, the only kind of connection IFC has to its past. Yeah. You know what I mean? Here's IFC, which sold itself about independent film. So Miller's Crossing is on this morning when I get up, right? Mm-hmm. I'm like, fuck, I forgot how great this movie is, and I'm watching it. Boom, commercial comes out of it anywhere. How independent is that that you throw? They don't even call themselves, like, they just use the term IFC. Right. Like, it means nothing now. Don't, don't worry about what that stands for. Was uh, Parker... The original Manic Pixie Dream Girl, or was it somebody else? I think that she was definitely one of those types that oftentimes got to play those like really kooky women. I think her, Winona Ryder, had that for a long time where it's like, I'm different and I'm weird and I'm, but you still want to. Joe, look that up for us. What did the Manic Pixie Dream Girl, who falls into it and see whether, look, just there's your computer. Look it up. I gotta p- even point out that part now. I want you to start typing. Look it up. G- find out the names and see if Gail and I agree. Uh, by the way, up on the iBank today, remember how we talked about Big J Okerson and him running on stage? The video is now up and you can see Big J Okerson push his physicality into superhero mode (laughs) it i think you really got to go back uh 
uh, and go to maybe the human suplex machine before someone had jumped into the ring and took over this way. Uh, Big J is Rose tonight, and that's going to be on the Anthony Cumia network. And I don't know whether that is just for subscribers or it's open to the general public. Look that up to me before, but it's worth subscribing to if you need to tonight. Uh, it's going to be part of the Rose, sorry, Shafir, and they all get together and they say mean things about Big J. Right. And <laughs> I was invited to the Rose and I said, I can't. I have nothing mean to say about Big J. You shan't go. I shan't even be able to look at that. It would be like some, seeing someone spit on the flag. Blag. <laughs> uh, all right, Joe, do you got a list? I do have a list. All right. The- Give us some of these names, see if we agree. The first Manic Pixie Dream Girl is credited to Catherine Hepburn in 1938. Well, they didn't call her that right. then, but okay. We have I, uh, more commentary, more uh, contemporary dream girls. No, more commentary. commentary. More commentary. commentary. <laughs> well, a dream girl is. Uh, we have Anne Hathaway, Zoe no. Deschanel. See, that's the, these things is exactly what you right. were talking about. By the time they put Anne Hathaway there, there was like, okay, there's an indie type. Let's take one of our stars and put her in that role and then sell a cheaper movie out to the public. Right. Natalie Portman in 2004 for Garden State. She was credited as one. She was definitely in that film. I don't know if she always goes in that. Well, Well, I think she was as a little tiny girl. You know what I mean? Like when she was a beautiful girl. Her in Beautiful Girls actually is... An uncomfortably young manic pixie dream girl. It's unbelievably uncomfortable. <laughs> and But I think one of the funniest scenes I've ever seen in the movie is the guy fucking skating with his two kids and just looking over yeah. with a horrified look, worried about his buddy. She does like a fake trip yeah. in order for uh, him to catch her and yeah. his friend's face like, don't. Please don't touch her. <laughs> He's so freaked and out. And then he went on and was, was mean to Jim Carrey by acting like they were friends together. All right, so yeah, I would put her in that role. We have Kate Hudson, 2000. Almost, almost famous. famous. Yes. Yeah, that's that's godlike. Christina Ricci in Buffalo 66. Yeah, I guess yeah. so. A little sloppier, dirtier version of that. <laughs> sure. In 1991, Paige O'Hara was credited with Beauty and the Beast. Please stop it with that. That's Bell. Okay. Your your alcoholism is really starting to (laughs) kick in, Joe. We didn't see it now. Five o'clock somewhere. (laughs) Five o'clock somewhere. (laughs) Goldie Hawn for Butterflies Are Free. That's actually pretty true. Yeah. That's pretty true. And she's she's one of those people that I think she's probably a manic pixie dream girl in life. Well, yeah, you know, but, it's not just that she's cast it, is that... But here's the thing. She gave birth to a manic pixie I dream know. girl. Now, when Kate Hudson was here for Unmasked, she lounged quite a bit, right? Mm-hmm. She was just lounging around and... Uh, Licking her paws. And, <laughs> and like everyone, like no matter who was talking in the room, everyone was just watching her. Right. And then in the and in the middle of the, uh, by the way, which I just love, because like when I went to meet her, you know, in the green room, she was like, Ron, thank you. And I'm like, I guess she likes me. I but guess that, we're in love now. We're dating <laughs> now. I didn't realize that we were going to start dating. I mm-hmm. guess we're terribly in love and, I, and you love me back. And I... I've got to make a couple of moves real fast. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, that's why she's a star. Everybody feels that way mm-hmm. around her. And then so she's like just purring and in her chair in between me and uh, some fucking dude. I forget that was part of this. Um, and in the middle of it, someone just brings her in this green sludge that she needed at a certain time of the day. She started to drink it before she died. <laughs> Because that she's just floating through air. She needs her medicine. And she was just spectacular. She was everything that you wanted her to be, 100%. And Parker is the same way. I mean, I think Parker gets that she's Parker Posey. Yeah. This one goes all the way back to 1972. Barbara Streisand in What's Up, Doc? Yeah, I don't know if I agree with that mm-hmm. one. I don't know. Pronunciation of it? Manic Pixie Yenta, I guess. <laughs> That, that could say. be a thing. Yeah, but. that could be our new thing <laughs> that we came up that we come up with. In 2006, Rachel Bilson, The Last Kiss. 
Yeah, I think that's, you know, another generation of it. I'm not going to take it away from her. Goldie Hawn again and Cactus Flower. Yeah. Always Goldie okay. Hawn. You Always act like Goldie you're reading Hawn. off a list of people who died <laughs> over the, it's a, the immemorial. We should be yeah. laughing in between. Yeah. Well, I was watching this great movie with uh, uh, Jeanne Moreau, Jules and Jim. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. Of course. All right. It's an old school one. Yeah. And I kind of think that, you know, the two dudes. Yeah. You know oh, I mean? yeah. Oh, I definitely. Kinda, I know this is getting out of the way, but I think this was about the two dudes. Mm-hmm. Being, you know, they just needed her in between so it didn't look too gay. Yeah. This, I think, my personal vote for the the original Audrey Hepburn Breakfast at Tiffany's. Yeah. Yes, she was definitely all those things. She was right? everything. Pixie and dream. And again, a life ruiner. You know what I mean? Like she acts like she comes into this world yeah. and she doesn't mean anything, anything but just things just crumble right. around With her. With her no care about right. what's happening or how she affects other people. Guys are just stabbing each other in the <laughs> neck and stealing from their wives. <laughs> abandoning their children she's everything to me and, and then she's like what i didn't know that you felt that way i'm leaving with this song i'm going to i'm going to the middle east right now some like it hot marilyn monroe i don't know if i put her there i wouldn't because i think she's too much of a bombshell knock- yeah a knockout right uh, what was the Cameron Crow that th- it was so obvious? The the kid who uh, bought the that made the world's worst sneaker. I think it was called the name of the movie was World's Worst Sneaker. Great title. Yeah, and he makes the world's worst sneaker and a bomb, so he has to go. And this little manic pixie dream girl just, you know, like really one oh one, just made up. Like, hey, how do we make this character? Went. And like put him on a road trip and had songs and forced him to go places. Right. Can't you think need of to name. find yourself. Yeah, I can't think of that thing. I think World's Worst Sneaker is the perfect title <laughs> for it. And then there was a great soundtrack, you know. Of course, yeah. But that's that's often their goal. It's like you need to live life in the moment. Like that's what always the point of Manic Pixie Dream Girls to tell them, right? Like you're not living. Yeah, that's really true. <laughs> Like, I might live in the basement here, and I don't wear shoes, <laughs> but I love life. And he's like, yeah, I'm too buttoned down, Party Girl. <laughs> Party Girl was the perfect yeah. version of that. The perfect version of that. Kate Winslet, 2004, alongside Jim Carrey, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless. Big yeah. time. And she was also very, like... I just do what feels right, and <laughs> you are so tight, and I'm... Yeah. Look, my hair's pink and green, see? Because it doesn't matter. I just show up. No one knows where I'm going to be. I live in the moment. Um, I don't know. All right, so anyway, that video of Big J Okerson at the comic strip is uh, up on the iBank today. Along with the world's best hula hooper. There's a lot of really great videos, but the world's best hula hooper. The world's best hula hooper. Yeah, this uh, little girl is amazing. I fancy myself a mediocre. Do you really? A uh, hula hooper. I, I feel like, watch this little girl. First of all, she is a cartoon, <laughs> right. this child. That's not a real human. That's yeah. a drawing. Now watch her go. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> what you're expecting? Look how serious her little face is. Look at her. It's it's all an attitude. This yeah. is it was like, if I look like a hula hooper, I am one. <laughs> I like that even after the hoop hits the ground, she doesn't give up. As if somehow. She can summon it. <laughs> summon it back up around her. And then there's just a really concerned superhero who walks behind her like, I don't know about that. I don't think you did a very good job on that. I have. I never even noticed that. Look, there he is. <laughs> like, uh, What's, what superhero is that anyway? Is it Spider-Man? I don't know. He I never know like who a, they are anymore. I guess everyone's Ant-Man. Everyone's an Ant-Man. We saw Ant-Man yesterday. We did. Along with Michael Douglas. I guess that's his real father. Michael Douglas. Yeah. 
It's a shocking. What revelation. was more exciting to you to see the Paul Rudd or to see the Michael Douglas? Uh, I would say Michael Douglas. In fact, I I got chills as I was walking up just hearing his voice. Like his voice his is voice so is the strongest iconic. thing about him. Yeah. Uh, so even it wasn't even so much seeing him, but hearing him talk, I yeah. had like chills. I was like, whoa. I uh, was at a party with both of them. It was the post Springsteen. Uh, Apollo party and it was like it was like the only time in my life I ever felt like I was at the Oscars right. you know what I mean that's how many people showed up people um big stars to look at Bruce Springsteen and it wasn't just Michael Douglas but he also had his wife they came in together you know right. and then Tom Hanks and his star wife and that night just went on and on and on like that was that surreal to to be in that quantity of uh, stars all around you? Yeah, it was nutty. But you know what was weird? It was like the next night there were no stars around. It felt even dumber. You know, <laughs> like I just felt like that's weird. Last night I was with all the stars. And tonight I'm a tasty delight standing <laughs> in line between behind some people who don't know whether they want sprinkles or not. And I just feel like me and Elvis Costello and Tom Hanks yeah. should all be bellied up to the bar. It should just keep happening. You can't yeah. step back. We've already yeah, started a, this new life. It was a giant step back <laughs> for me. You know what I mean? I fell from grace. You know, and I didn't like it so much. I liked it better when it was me and Bruce and Hanks together. Yeah, the way it should be. Yeah. But those people have a love for Bruce Springsteen like you wouldn't believe. The stars love Bruce. They don't love every rock and roll performer, but they love some. What do you think what do you think the reason is? Do you think it has to do with his music or his persona? His I, I actual, couldn't tell you, but their excitement level of when like he went up in the balcony and like I saw like you know, them, the stars pointing into the balcony like there and looking is. at each like, can you believe it? <laughs> He's climbed into the balcony. It was the weirdest thing to see that happen. I don't know why they wouldn't just yell out some of their movies. I'm also him. I've also had a successful life. <laughs> two two Oscars. He's got one. A lot of Grammys over here going crazy for you. But then we uh went to uh Metallica. Well, you know, we did Metallica up there. And then the only star was Patrick Wilson and his son. And that they, I think, had, even though that he had, like, uh, he had put jet uh, headphones on his son's ears. Uh, to protect the, from the... The boys yeah. still look like he went down from the from the extreme noise. Now, didn't you say you had seen Metallica years ago and you felt like the noise level was like no other? I know that yeah. it, it, that was one of my... Uh, damaged hearings nights i knew i i knew like that night i'm like well i probably lost 25 years of hearing <laughs> in this one ear and i was pissed about it that's one of the scariest feelings like if you're if you're in a small venue that is playing like it's a big venue and then you have that ringing that won't leave well guess what for hours on end that's what pete townsend and neil young have today Right, that they just live in that. They live in that, which has got to be right up there with being blind. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like, but the pain that you would get from just hearing that, a lot of drummers get it. You know, now right. of course they're smart enough that they all have stuff in their ears. But you know, when rock started, it didn't occur to any of them. Right, because we we weren't dealing with things at that volume ever before. Probably no. I think originally. Guys that worked at the airport just walked out to the planes right. before someone stopped them. Well, all the guys, you know, all the dads in my neighborhood were hard of hearing from working in factories. Right. So you had to yell at every dad in my neighborhood. And they wouldn't even be that old. Yeah. You'd be like, is, is Stevie at home? The guy would just be sitting there with, they always had their fucking shoes sitting in the backyard. They couldn't wear their shoes inside because there was all kinds of shit on it. And they always seemed like they had dirty socks and they just 
start to drink immediately. And like now that I look back on it, these old broken down men were probably thirty five or thirty eight. You know, and these they were harder were times. Just beat to death. You know, there was no way they were going to see retirement. Um. It's always funny if you think back of the way you viewed age, too, when you were young. Like, you think everyone is, oh, that guy's really old. And then suddenly you're that age and you're like, no. No, not so old. But, yeah, I I do kind of feel like people let the. Well, this is the weirdest thing I think that ever happened. In about 1968, they started to have oldie stations. And most of those songs were from 1958 or 59. (laughs) So people who were 27 or 28 considered themselves museum pieces. Like this one station plays stuff from when I was in high school eight years ago. (laughs) Yeah. You know, now I have seven kids, you know, like they really got old fast and they put away childhood fast. And they didn't think there was anything new for them. Yeah. Like when people uh, reflect on simpler times, it's a much longer period of time, I think, yeah. that people have now are like, uh, all of my 20s. So, like, that was not something that was like, oh, uh, when my, my 20s, I was so young. People right. didn't feel like that. No. That was that was when people were getting married. They were having kids. They were yeah. set in their careers for many years at that point. But yeah, they had kids on their tits and they weren't fucking hanging around with the same people <laughs> right. that they went to school with. You right. know, they had moved off somewhere and they were just like, I don't know whether we're going to have enough money for these children. You know, I don't know what we're going to do. I hope we survive this. Yeah, I don't think this is going to happen. We might all have to give my children to our moms. <laughs> She'll know what to do. That's what they just do sometimes. Just like hand the kids to their moms and go, we're going to go out west and look for work. <laughs> and if it works out, we'll call you. Right. And the mom is just We'll wave- send for the children. Yeah, the mom was just waving goodbye like, I'll never see them again. Yeah. I guess it still happens when, um, like, you meet those people who were raised by their grandmother and they called her, like, mama or some kind of yeah. crazy thing. And that's where they went to get sugar. I I always thought the kids who were raised by their grandparents were always like they're a very specific type of young person. Right. You know, like uh, they were into the same things that their grandparents were into. <laughs> they shared a lot of interests. Like they talked with the inflection of their grandparents. Yeah. They were they were like an interesting. Bre- I knew a couple kids who grew up with their grandparents as their grandparents and they were they were weirdos in a great way i mean they were so unique and strange well now you know you have a lot of kids whose dad is like their grandparents who <laughs> should be their grandfather like i was just trying to think of who had kids just the other day some dude in his like 60s and you're like okay funny in a modern family sketch but I don't know if I'd really want to deal with that. Oh, walk through Brooklyn. It's all of all of Brooklyn is elderly parents, like new parents, right. with like three, four year old kids. The and they're all level. gray. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Like they it's the I don't know. It's I think it's generationally it's moving. It moved in that. But I also think it's something to do with uh, urban environments as well. I think yeah. that people have kids later in life if they live in the city it's actually not a bad idea because really what do you want to do travel when you get older why not travel when you're younger right when you're older you just yell at kids like did you get that done exhausted (laughs) don't push me don't physically push me i can't fight back you're too strong for me i need big j to run up on stage and just stop both, Everything that's happening. Both comedian and bouncer. Big J. Taking all the jobs. Boy, when you say what the hell was going on in that club before Big J jumped up, you're like, was this the least funny fucking show that ever happened? Somebody's pulling a name out of a, a fucking jar for 18 uh, mi- uh, minutes. Uh, look who it is. It's our old pal Liz Sets Fire. Hey, buddies. Um, hey. I'm 
I had a, a family member actually that um, they had this weird, rare hearing disease where um, they were super sensitive to everything. Like he had to get his car uh, like padded so he couldn't hear the rattling. And he said that he constantly just felt like he was uh, hearing like fluorescent lighting. And uh, he was a doctor. He actually cut the hearing and deafened himself, and it didn't go away. So oh eventually, my god! Oh. Yeah, you're, you're just freaking he, uh... me out now. <laughs> that part just freaked me out. That somebody would be able to, as you put it, cut the hearing. Oh. He did. He was then, a doctor, and he cut his own hearing, and it didn't stop. Oh my god! Then he made it up. I swear, no, he uh, he actually, he was a doctor, and one day he went out to the garden, and he took a bunch of blood thinners, and he uh, sliced an artery. Oh. Oh, my God. This is... And that was the end of that. This is a Twilight Zone episode. It is a Twilight Zone. Someone with yeah, sensitive it was hearing. And this horrific. Is, I mean, you, we always say, don't kill yourself, but what else? Did the guy have another choice? No. If It could drive you mad enough to do something like that. That's, That's like exactly living in Chinese happened. water torture. You know what I mean? Like yes. you, you're experiencing torture, but it's Ugh. your whole life. Yep. Uh, no matter what he did, it wouldn't go away. And he was like, no, I'm sorry. I just can't, can't do it anymore, guys. He actually said that, but loud because he thought <laughs> yeah. it was loud. Though. You know, I had a cousin who killed himself because of mosquitoes. He just hated them. <laughs> he hated so them. yeah, <laughs> he's like one year, you know, June was coming. He's like, fuck it. I can't, I can't not another summer. I can't. Not a skeeter summer. <laughs> The holidays are hard on people. I've heard some horrific things, but what Liz just told was the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. I'll talk to you later, buddies. Say it. You know, to me, whenever you watch like one of those documentaries about jail, the noise is the most annoying thing to me. The yeah. noise and the light. You it's... know what I mean? Like the lights are always on and all of those assholes are always fucking yelling or banging stuff. You get no peace. No, no fucking peace. No fucking sleep to Brooklyn. You know, it, when describing hell, I think they focus a lot on the heat. They need to talk about the noise. The level. noise, You're yes. really going to reach people. Okay. Writing up my short story. <laughs> I'm just going to put heat as noise, parentheses, <laughs> hell. Uh, and then louder than hell right. could be the name of it or going to raise hell. Um, you know, I was just bringing up uh, prison. Barack Hussein Obama, the Kenyan-born president of the United States, mm -hmm. has asked entertainers to stop making rape jokes. Uh, it's not funny, and he wants to stop. Well, let me just say this. The worst thing about being raped in prison is not the jokes <laughs> that take place. And I would also say this. There's, this is not an officially written rape joke. You know right. what I mean? This is just things people say if someone's going into jail that they're going to take it in the ass. And the reason people say that is that this happens. Yes. It's truthful and it's horrifying. And we uh, choose to make light of it. But having the president ask people to stop <laughs> telling rape jokes it's like, didn't you learn anything like as a child, like when an authority figure says something like this is how you get a million rape jokes. You know what I mean? Like he should have just said what you're asking. He should have just said this. I no longer want the rectum dis described as a fart box. <laughs> it's so boy, do I have a tweet right now? <laughs> it's so weird to say that. First of all, it's like telling people to stop making fun of school lunches. The reason yeah. why people do rape jokes is that we're all horrified right. by it. And it probably, prison rape probably keeps most of us from committing crimes. Right. It isn't so much five years in a room. Yeah. It's that sometimes you need a shower and you'll be raped. Most men, when talking about incarceration, it's the first thing they bring up. Like, I, cu I couldn't survive in there because well, of the... The constant raping that I know I, I would receive. <laughs> I know. I think what he's trying to say is stop making black jokes because no one ever does a white rape joke. No one ever says to themselves, by the way, those Nazis are going to rape me. When I hear a rape joke, it is always tied in with a racial right. remark. So I think that's what he probably means. By the way, the thing that he's standing in front of there, right? With the, the podium? Yeah, the podium and the presidential seal. 
that never changes. That looks exactly like what JFK would be standing in front of. There's no updated version of that. They have a really good brand going. But no one else uses it. Like, you won't turn on the Emmys <laughs> and the host will come out and stand behind that. You know what I mean? They used to at one point. But we've moved. You won't go to a roast and see a podium <laughs> right. like that. But they used to. But everyone has moved on except for the president of the United States. Now, I'm going to tell you something because I've done that podium gimmick before. And I can tell you this. The presidential seal they don't even put up there until the almost the last minute, right when he gets there. You're in front of a podium that whole time, right? A blank podium. You don't get the seal. <laughs> you don't get the seal. Then at the last minute, they put up the podium. So I did non-seal podium bits, and then straight podium with the seal bits. So when you go back and look at the pictures, sometimes. I'm in front of the seal and sometimes I'm not. I'm just in front of any regular podium. But it reminded me of like when the communion host actually gets blessed. Yeah. Then and only then is it the is it Christ. Right. Now it's a presidential podium. Before just a mere regular Joe's podium. Regular Joey Jojo Ramon podium. One of my podiums from home. Uh Parker Posey today. Parker Posey today uh are you gonna do the air raid freshman bitches i will not do any impressions at her will you do one now just to get it out of your system wipe that face off your head bitch it's pretty good you know air raid or it's your ass i like that too i wish that you would do it i won't you shan't i shan't you shan't or won't i shall not uh, the new movie that she's in is Woody Allen. I think it's called Sleepers 2. No, it's not. Um, it is a fine new movie called Irrational Man. Mm -hmm. And it stars uh, River Phoenix's younger brother, Joaquin. Joaquin. Joaquin Phoenix, who is not crazy. Although you won't know that watching this movie i noticed this uh it's this is one of those woody allen movies where i see raves and just pans at the same time yeah people Polarizing. love or hate the woody allen right now uh the one and only parker posey you know her as so many uh different suburbia party girl house Days of yes the, house of yes which was a <laughs> Crazy favorite of yours when Obsessed, you were a kid. Obsessed, yeah, of her playing Jackie O, or the character who is known as Jackie O. Um, I heard Voss this morning, and he felt the same way about House of Yes as you did. Um, they quick gave Voss a call and said, what movies have you seen her in? <laughs> the one and only, Parker Posey. I remember you guys, and you were in the same room. We were in the same room. So and do a lot of press, so... Well, we've got the, yeah, you don't have to use that. You don't have I to don't use that. Like we don't need those. I do like the Beatles. You know, um, this is the SUNY Purchase Mafia. Th all three of you. That's what? right. SUNY Purchase grads. Purchase! Yes. Gail, Hello. you were in writing? You in I was dramatic writing, oh, yeah, cool. which is actually... Um, a major that doesn't exist anymore, but it came off of the film program, and they oh, had cool. that for a couple of years, and oh, then they cool. killed it off. Did uh, you like your teachers? Yes. Uh, Howard Enders, who's been there a, a million years, he's, he's just <laughs> passed away not too long ago, Aww. but he was incredible. And uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, he had been there so long, he worked with Hal Hartley when he mm -hmm. was there in the film program, and yeah, he mm -hmm. was incredible. Yeah, it was a great program. I'm really glad that I that I went there. I was on probation for three years. What was the problem? <clears throat> Attitude. Okay. <laughs> um, I kept my probation letters in the freezer. <laughs> for whatever, I didn't even know why I kept them in the freezer. Well, that's um, the best way to save them. <clears throat> and it takes. I think it takes away their power. Like you put a horror book in the freezer. <clears throat> that's right. Nothing can happen to you. But then it kind of lasts forever if I freeze it. That is true. That part of it is true. <laughs> you know, when I was in L.A. a few weeks ago for the premiere of Irrational Man, and I went into one of those chirogenetic uh, machines, freezers. Have you heard of this? Mm -mm. It's like 170 below freezing. And um, you go into this 
refrigerator, freezer, and uh, you play music for like two minutes or three minutes, and it regenerates your cells. Apparently, I hope so. That's did you did you feel like it worked for this you? This is like you one of those legit? L.A. things. <laughs> yeah. And then I came out, you know, and they were like, yeah, your metabolism, you'll be starving after you leave. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's it's supposed to, you know, I like to try different things like that. So so I tried it. And I was like. Is there anywhere in New York you have this? <laughs> like, Winter. No. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, you, it, now you, I think, it, doing a Woody Allen movie, right? That's the pure New York actor experience. I know. Yeah. I know. I know. I felt really, uh, really blessed to be there. It felt great. Just his intelligence and his wit and uh, being able to say his lines and be this complicated woman. You know, my part's not that big. I worked like eight days, but I just come in and out of it. And just, he's such, he's such a master storyteller, writer. It was, right. it was amazing. Actually, one of the reasons why I even wanted to ever move to New York was Woody Allen movies. Just seeing Woody Allen movies and say, yeah, it's got to be done. It's hard not to see the city through his lens, I think. Yeah, yeah. he, uh, uh, and he actually saw the city in a certain way before the city was that. You know right. what I mean? He saw like a romantic type of New York when it wasn't a romantic New York, you know? <sighs> yeah. I thought a lot about jazz when I worked with right. him. He has such a, 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 a jazz essence of... Um, storytelling and movement and whimsy and wit and just you know moving forward he likes to work very fast um he's so idiosyncratic you know he's so special and and he's he kind of does it all and he kind of does it all at once um i heard the story through someone else that um when louis ck was on uh, blue jasmine they said you're going to uh, you go dance with, with Sally Hawkins. And he's like, I don't know what to do. And he's like, well, just take her by, you know, a little arm here. You turn her and maybe move her over here. And apparently Louis was like, I'm not you. I can't just like take that, you know, be graceful. I mean, yeah. he's very, he's very graceful. He's and, and elegant and, um, and sardonic and witty and, I mean, uh, so he's a lot of things. It was, um, and yeah, he shaded New York for, for me too. I didn't, um, really watch his movies until, you know, I was in my twenties, mm -hmm. uh, Hannah and her sisters and crimes and misdemeanors and interiors. Of course, now when I watch them as a, as a grown woman, wow. Yeah. I mean, so he, um, there are very few directors and movies made these days that um, that use actors in the way that he, that he uses actors. So, uh, you know, there are very few movies made today that are based on chemistry between actors. This is like something that that we're, we've lost, um, but it'll come back on Amazon or Netflix. Oh. But anyway, it was. Um, it was great to work with him. But isn't it funny that we even have to say that about movies when it was the entire reason for movies for its first, you know, seven, eight decades was about the human experience and people right. reacting. And now we're like, oh, isn't this unusual? It's a movie about people talking and falling in love and having problems. Yeah, I mean, where you actually rely on dialogue. I think that they, there's times where uh, you see that films are going in that direction and then we lose it and yeah. then it has to come back as opposed to why would that ever go away? Why would I that know, ever go out strange. of style? It's strange to me, you know, doing so many independent movies in the 90s, um, which was very much like the 70s. Um, I thought that there was going to be a resurgence of film that would last for forever, you know, that mm -hmm. would keep on building. But that didn't happen at all. And it didn't happen in the 70s either. And we saw right. different movies form out of the 70s into the 80s. Um, Woody Allen has survived through all of this and changed with the changing times and, uh, you know, how movies get financing and uh, his storytelling. And he's, 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 he's changed with the um 
Yeah. I watched his movies as a way to learn about adults and um, adult uh, experiences that women, uh, especially women, go through. I think of Sandy Dennis in Another Woman and Mia Farrow and Jenna Rollins and uh, Geraldine Page in Interiors and Mary Beth Hurt and Diane Keaton. And these are, you know, these are like almost private, you know, his, his movies feel very private to me when I watch women go through, you know, what mm-hmm. they're going through. Um, so it was, uh, it was a great creative experience. It was great to uh, say the least. Yeah. That's <laughs> a, but you know, it's that, uh, well, you know what you're talking about the nineties and Woody made so many great movies in the nineties too, but didn't it seem like we had a new filmmaker every year breaking out in the nineties and, and most of those people I still follow like most of the people who broke out and had the big sundance movie anywhere from like 91 to 98 i'm still you know whether it's ed burns and kevin smith and the list goes on and on of just people to follow you know yeah <clears throat> yeah let's hope ted hope at amazon who's an independent film producer in, of the 90s brings back those filmmakers and supports the filmmakers of the nineties and, and their gift of storytelling because they're still writing these stories. It's not like they forgot how to write yeah. movies in this way. And you know, the essence of their craft and that they're not talented and they don't have distinctive voices. It's just that the culture doesn't support the distinctive individual voice in these times because of, because of money. Yeah. But then, of, of but then last year you had boyhood and you're like, this is what we've all been talking about. You know, yeah. put it out there. We'll show up. People will be there. Just give it a chance. Put them in the theaters. You know, you have to pay yeah. to put it in the theater. And then the investors make their money back in like five or 10 years or something like that. So it's not, it it's takes not set up to win. Away. It's not set up to win anymore. Right. Right. Wow. It's depressing. Yeah. But I mean, I wish those all these banks in New York City became like <laughs> independent, you know, you know, like film forum, and and with 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 coffee and wouldn't that be wine great? And, and seriously, wouldn't that be and great? And people just like talking about film and and you know having <clears throat> opinions and being able to be opinionated and to share and to laugh about what they see or to it's we're, we're losing that. Yeah. We're really losing that. Um, but maybe it'll, it'll come around. It's got to, it's got to, right? Sure. Well, there's, it seems like, um, you know, with TV shows now we're seeing a sort of resurgence in that where it seems like people become very committed to these really great shows. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> you've worked on a couple great shows recently. You did Louie and yeah. you did Amy Schumer show yeah. last season. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, I think, you know, I, th- I think that is a new resurgence in that way. Well, yeah, it's a self creator, right? Like, mm-hmm. like Woody Allen. Um, and you know, agents are expecting that from their clients too. Like right. you should just really make your own show. And <clears throat> so I've, I've played around with that in my head. Um, but I, it's not where my bones are. You know, I feel like I like working with the director and being a part of that. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah. But these, the stories that are popular on TV, they have lots of hooks in them. So you get hooked in, you know, yeah. you get addicted to them. It's very different than like what I hope will come back in style. A yeah. three hour landscape movie right. that takes you to another country, turns you on to a different culture. Sure. Well made by real filmmakers that know how to tell a story. And, you know? and certainly you have audiences who are now investing that time in TV, which, you know, they're spending all this time with these characters over all these episodes. It, it, it would make sense that they would be able to do the same for film again. You know, yeah. it's like that they would and, be able to the take novel, the time. Yeah, sure. Remember when movies were, were based on great novels? <laughs> <laughs> but it's been a while since we've had. I mean, we, we don't set up a world with great novelists anymore. Right. I mean, Norman Mailer was a famous person. We don't have right, famous right. novelists anymore. People don't embrace it. And, you know, TV and there's great TV, but it isn't the same 
experience of what Parker was talking about. When you go out to a film, you're leaving your house, right. you're sitting in the dark with strangers, and you're either laughing mm -hmm. or crying together. That community uh, can't be lost. It's like if if you watch, you know, like a religious thing on TV, it's not the same as being in a church with the choir and That's people right. singing, you know? I mean, yeah. they're, you're they're not with, listening together. Yeah, right. There was always a, I always thought a secular spirituality about cinema and rock and roll where you needed to mm -hmm. be out with people and these strangers all become one together. You know, we all have one experience. We share it and we leave there and we it's hold on to it. It's as old as the Greeks. Yes. You know? And yes. it's part of, it's part of our connectedness as people to share in, in theater and in fiction and in storytelling. So we're in a really strange time. We're liking images and moving right right past them. Yeah, and I think watching these separately on a phone and then tweeting about it is a it's a different time type of <laughs> yeah. connected. It's not it's not that same experience. And it becomes like and don't like and like and don't like instead right. of like oh wow well. well you know, what about, how about losing the art of talking about what movies, you know? Sure. And so it's like, mm, I don't like her anymore. Oh, I like her. And right. then like conversation yeah. over. Yeah. Like, wow, I'm fascinated. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you feel like you have to kind of teach um, people how to, how to talk about movies. And yeah, it's not about who's right or wrong. And, you know, it's complex and it's human. And you can talk about the actors like, like you, you know, like you know them. Yeah. Like you, what your impressions are, and and make it like, you know, a beautiful thing. And and but we're in we're in hero villain. You right, know, we are. We're in, we're in good and bad. Yeah, it's we wrestling. Are, we are winning. You know, we have to be winning now. Yeah. And that's kind of the that's the vibe. Yeah. yeah, it's very much like pro, pro wrestling where here comes the good guy and oh, he's getting beat up. He's got then he wins. Yeah. Right. OK, <laughs> you know, it, it's made it, uh, it, it. It's it's like we're talking to children all the time yeah. rather than having these movies that you leave with. And you're like fighting over and wrestling in yourself and you see yourself on the screen, exactly. except for one thing, you know, right. we do, you know, uh that that's what i thought like the first uh richard link letter that i i uh, like daisy confused you're daisy talking about confused. daisy confused yeah where i went okay everything was you know i lived on the other side of the country is the same except for the paddling did the, and then you found out from people there were communities that used to yeah. paddle the young people and i'm like what how did that even happen <laughs> but you could watch that movie and go wait was i a little meaner than i should have been was i you know we had a 10 year reunion for that movie at a at a drive in theater yeah. in austin and it was incredible. People stood up. They sang along. They drank beer. Yeah. They partied. They turned to each other and laughed in the grass. They recited lines back up to the screen. And it, it captured a real essence of mm. a time, the 70s. And I'm, you know, I'm a child of the 70s. I'm so glad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he he his genius is so amazing, Rick Linklater, especially after Boyhood. Yeah, it's like, amazing to see. Like, it. Yeah, yeah. There's actual thought in this. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I loved that movie. I remember in L.A. I just uh, I have new representation now, and and uh, it was a real litmus test. It's like, did you like Boyhood? <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Oh, I was kind of bored. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like, that's it. <laughs> yeah, you have You're soul. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about Woody having personal films. That was what was so great about Boyhood is it felt so personal. It was, like, so tied in to him, his experience. It, I think yeah. that's really uh, yeah. what connected people with it. I, I, I still th I feel like Party Girl is the same type of thing. That, that, <laughs> that movie was... And in and, and the strangest ways ahead of its time, because I'll be in Brooklyn now and I'll be like, that looks exactly like I'm I'm watching Party Girl. You know, these right. kids are so on the edge just to live in New York. You know, what I mean, they mm -hmm. have to put so much into it just to survive mm -hmm. here, you know, but I know, and there's, I know. you know, no one comes here and gets a cheap place anymore. No one comes and gets yeah. their own 
personal place. I know. Place. I lived in a rent control apartment for 13 years in Chelsea. Yeah. That was... Uh, yeah, thank God. Yeah. 736 a month. But if you even think Can about... You imagine? Yeah. It doesn't exist anymore. It can't. And that's why we had artists like, you know, Willem Dafoe would come here and it would take, you know, 15 yeah. years before he would come back. And he, were like, he was like, oh, I was living free, you know, in right. Soho. You know, we just broke into a place and I, you know, I just stayed here. But I think that part of New York is what we're missing. Is Bohemia. That, yeah. yeah. I can't be Bohemian anymore. Now people are moving upstate and to different cities. Yeah, Actually, and sometimes and small communities, which I guess is cool, but you're staying with the people you went to right. college with. I, I think the big mix is what helped. You diversity. Know? Yeah, yeah, diversity people is important. Of age and race. And I remember, uh, yeah, when I was on the soap, this was so strange to me, but there was a, a, a homeless man who recognized me from the soap. And I think he watched it on a TV, like in a storefront somewhere. You go, how's the show? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Wow. Yeah, that was always the beautiful thing about New York, I think, is that you could be touched. You couldn't be aloof enough, right. no matter how much money you had. or fi- You were still walking down the street with, with everybody awareness. else. Yeah, with, with awareness. awareness. Right. And that's a practice. And... It's I I love that, you know, it's one of the reasons why I live in New York. It keeps you on your toes. It does, right? And, um, yeah, it can be, you know, a meditation in a way. I just think the fact of like when the city was in trouble also was when we got the Ramones and Basquiat and Saturday Night Live and all these things Mm -hmm. that happened that for some reason weren't kind of appreciated by the main, you know, kind of media at the time. But if you look back on it, when the city was in its biggest, biggest trouble, you know, Keith Haring breaks out. Yep. Uh, It was just, there was something about that. And also, of course, the people weren't staying home, that you had to leave your house at night. To be entertained, you know? Yeah, and you don't live in a, a home to have a big house. Right. You right. live in the city to, to, to be around people and to and to leave your apartment. Um yeah, and to connect. Uh yeah, that that struggle will always create artists and uh there there are still artists in New York that are that are struggling. Yeah. We're all just kind of waiting for, you know, what it's going to turn into, what the art world is going to turn into. I mean, I have a friend who's a painter, and it's really tough. It's really tough. I just read a book by Siri Hutzfeld called "This Blazing, The Blazing World about an artist in her 60s who becomes pseudo... She has three pseudonyms behind men, three men who are famous artists. And she has these shows. It's such a good book. I'm loving it. Um, I just finished it. But yeah, I mean, it's still happening. It will always happen. People will always be attracted to New York City. Um, they're still, you know, now they're not living in Brooklyn. They've moved up to Harlem. It's, it's yeah. they're, they're going upstate, you know, but it will always have that romanticism. We were talking about Woody Allen, that creative spirit of... Uh, being in the moment and going with your desires and and always walking and i I still think like theater can have that like it's particularly off broadway where you just walk into a place and you not quite know what to expect and you also forget that that sometimes when uh uh a certain art communities things are happening it's hard to see where that scene is going to go right. while you're still in it yeah. you know it's i think that's why we romanticize different and you uh, always think it's going to yeah. last forever but in retrospect you see like oh that was a real community and now now the culture has moved to this 
But I think any great artist would look back at a generation two or three before them and say, that was the time, you know, that I should have been. That was the cool time. Uh, and someone will be saying that about their scene. You're always going to feel yeah. out of time or misunderstood. But what he just did that movie a couple of years ago where people, you know, look back 20 right. years earlier. But, but you are right, though. I think that you can't have it without a scene. I think there has to be like-minded people coming together no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. And... And kind of one of the sad things, I think this happened with the 90s thing, is once they start to go, okay, you're the directors and we'll throw more money at your budgets, people go off in a different, you know, places. But the producer took the place of the director. Yeah. That's what, that's what happened. And so they say, I'm sorry, the, the money people won't let you make this movie if you cast this actress. Right. Because on the number sheet, her numbers aren't very high. And we saw this in music, too. Like music became like a numbers thing. Sure. Like songs had to sound like other songs that made money. And this is, you know, around 2000, I guess. Yeah. And now that's the sameness. Yeah. We lost of, that. Of the, it, art, of the art. Yeah. We lost that excitement level of we had about just a bunch of kids from some town just banging it out together yeah. until they and us watching them. You know, go from, okay, we just start here, look where we are three albums later. You know it's still happening somewhere. Yeah. You know, it, and it is happening somewhere. Yeah. We can't forget that. We just we just don't know where it is because we're not young. Well, yeah, now now it's more like looking for gold on the beach. You know, you got to just go through all this sand before you find something little and shiny. Uh, but we do have somebody shiny right here, Parker Posey. Thank you so much. Uh Oh, thank you. We all adore you, you so again. much. Seriously, you. I adore you guys too. I will never I coming back here. At, no matter what you're doing, I'll always be there. Uh, Irrational Man comes out everywhere this Friday, July seventeenth. SonyClassics dot com slash Irrational. We'll see you again, Parker. See you. Take care, darling. Take care. You're listening to Bennington on Raw Dog Comedy Hits, Sirius XM ninety nine. Yeah, 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 yeah. What movie was that, by the way? It was a little movie called Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Did they ever find out where their brother art? They never did. All right, I'm going to play a little trivia with you right now. The name Tito Beveridge is he famous for A, writing the song Born to Be Wild, B, writing a little play called Waiting for Goodell, or C, Coming up with Tito's Handmade Vodka, America's Original Craft Vodka. Yes. I know this. Yes. I'm going to go with C. You know what? Probably because the, the name thing gave it away, didn't it? Yeah. It's yeah. right in the name, but I knew that anyway. Well, let me tell you something. It was also a trick question. He did write Born to be Wild. What? And he did write, also write, Waiting for Goodell, which... By the way, they waited and waited and he never showed up. I don't want to ruin that play for anyone. I know it's considered the best play of all time. It is, yeah. No one does show up! Spoiler alert. You wait, you wait, you wait for what? You know, this is uh, like if you you played Rocky, right? Like you were doing Rocky. And it was like just the big fight for Apollo Creed. And they go like this. I don't know where Creed is. He's not... Uh, He's not coming here. <laughs> Would anyone think that Rocky was great? No. That's how I feel about waiting for Godot. I, if Godot would have showed up and then the payoff would have been there, I'd call it the greatest play of all time. The first two acts were fantastic, but there was no third act. You don't have a third act! That's what I was screaming. Now, Born to be Wild had everything that you'd ever want. You know, smoke and lightning, heavy metal thunder. And of course, like a true nature's child, you were born, born to be wild. You're going to fly so high, you never want to die. High. And I would go like this. Wait, do they say they don't want to die high? You know what I mean? Like they don't want to get so high that they overdose. And people are like, no, that's just die. And I go, well, I know for a fact there's not two syllables in that word. Also... There's not three acts in Waiting for Godot. That's a fucking two-act play. Uh, Tito's Handmade Vodka. There's nothing like it out there, is it? Uh, 
Gail, if I was to say to you, what's the greatest vodka in the world? What would you say? For me? Yeah. Tito's. Now, do you know that I grew up in a world where that was not true? I grew up in a world that if you wanted to drink a good vodka, you had to turn your back on the United States and you had to genuflect before the hammer and sickle. And don't, and l- let me tell you something, folks. Joseph Stalin was no picnic. I don't know why he doesn't get the bad rap Hitler gets, but this guy was hell on wheels. And I'm not drinking his damn vodka. I drink an American vodka out of Austin, Texas. Tito's and made vodka. Tito changed it for everyone. He changed us, didn't he? He did. He made us feel like we can stand up to the commies. You know, I I remember when I said this to Lyndon Johnson, I'm not going to go to sleep under a, a communist moon. I, correction. That was in the right stuff. Not the book. It never showed up in the book. It was in the movie. Movies are different than books. You know why? They want to show you. They don't want to tell you. Okay? Now, I'd rather be shown that there's a good doubt. Not told that he's coming and then he doesn't. That's me. I'm an American. Like Tito Beveridge. (sighs) I'd go door to door to sell this stuff. I love it so much. Door to door. Unfortunately, that's illegal. You can't have like a vodka version of the ice cream man just, you know, hitting a little wing uh, ringer. I think a lot of people would feel that way and they'd follow you. You'd get a team of people. That scares me, because I always feel like I'm being followed. Traveling the country, pushing Tito's vodka. I you, bet you could you could reach the people that way. You just described a carnival. Yeah. Uh, and what I like to say is, Tito's, it's like a carnival for your mouth. You do uh, always say that. I say it quite a bit. Chris, hit the click check, track, and take us out of here. Tito's Handmade Vodka is distilled six times from 100% corn and is naturally gluten-free. Visit us at titosvodka.com for recipes, songs, and more. 40% alcohol by volume and crafted to be savored responsibly. Uh, for some reason, we were talking during a commercial about how much we all like Judah Freelander. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we just talk about that because we love him so. I wish that he was at the comic strip the night that Big J had to run on stage. You think he would have helped Big J? He would have picked up the entire stage. (laughs) It's world champ. Um, The video was up there, and I have to tell you, I have to tell you, Big J, I expect it more. (laughs) (laughs) The way he was telling it. I had it very violent in my mind, Uh, but I thought Big J was sweet and responsible. Now, somebody wrote about this guy here. What's his name? William Stevenson. Um, They said the rape accusations have really taken their toll on Cosby. (laughs) That was a comment up on the eye bang. Let me see some of these uh, comments. Look at this tough guy. This is true, bro. Shut the shithole down. I like the patronizing pat that Jay also gave the dude. <laughs> and someone just wrote, I miss your musk. Uh, Reran read the, the rape joke that made me LOL. Um... Then John says, how the fuck did that pig score such a handsome gentleman? Hashtag no homo. Hashtag some homo. <laughs> it's okay to have some homo. Uh, the club owner should be embarrassed. Now, let me uh, just tell you a little bit about Richie Tinkin, that Jay is Facebook battling on this. He truly is a legend in comedy. The comedy sh- sh- uh, strip has been there since 1976. Amazing stars have come out of the place. Uh, you know, Chris Rock, Murphy, Larry Miller. I think Colin was a, if I'm not wrong, Colin was a bartender there first. Really? Before anything else. Yeah. Um, and so, did Seinfeld used to do stand up? Seinfeld there was a regular yeah. there in the early uh, mid 70s, I guess. I brought this up. Billy Crystal was the first person on stage wow. in that place. The first person to walk up on stage at the place. Um, and quite frankly, Richie Tinkin, I don't even believe that he's the one writing the Facebook. 
Yeah. I believe it's got to be someone. Big J had a suspicion as well, right? I mean, he was thinking it could be someone else. But this one, I am going to sign up with Richie Tinkin. I'm pro Richie Tinkin when he says this statement. <laughs> if Okerson ever becomes a star, I'm leaving this country. <laughs> <laughs> it will only mean that the country is finished and our morals have gone up in flames. You know, and it's it's an extreme stance, but it's you, one I agree with 100 <laughs> percent. Uh, well, you will see Big J in uh, in battle uh, up on the eye bang. It's a fucking great thing. Now, by the way, tonight, let's see if we got to the bottom of this tonight. Big J's roast will be on the Anthony Cumia network. Do we know whether you have to sign up for that? We're looking it up right now. When did I ask? An hour ago. I was asked an hour ago. Did you follow up on that? Uh, no. Out of spite. Don't no. bother looking it up. I'm just going to leave it to fate, Joe. You know why? You guys are having a lot of great conversations over there. So I want to keep that going. I want to keep what I like to do. I like to be the kind of uh, coach. When I look over in the bullpen, I like to see my guys grab an ass and, you know, smoking cigarettes. Do? Yeah. I like to see him jacking off in a cup and then throwing it w at women as they walk by, yeah. like my old producer Migs used to fucking do. <laughs> um, but I don't know whether you have to be signed up to the Anthony Comia Network or it'll be open to you, the unclean general public. But a roast, uh, a lot of people saying mean stuff about Jay. Um, it's all up there. Jesse Eisenberg, who you've known for a long time, yeah. compared Comic Con to genocide. Um, he said it's the like with that amount of people screaming at you, there's something on a cellular level. <laughs> now, genocide is one of those things that you have to be careful how you use it because I I know like we do say this. Well, this dude's worse than Hitler, and no one gets mad at you, right? Right. But you can't act like you didn't get the dessert you wanted and then be like, this is worse than the, the, the cleansing of six million Jews. You can't say <laughs> that. Even if it really feels that way in the moment. And thousands of people yelling your name. Now, here's what I think Jesse kind of means, right? They don't care about Jesse Eisenberg. No. Yeah. They only care about... Lex Luger and the wait, Lex Luger's Luther. Rest. Yeah. <laughs> Luther. That's the person I was really trying to compare Big J to. <laughs> Lex Luther. So, you know, that must feel weird. Well, I think it's uh one of those things where people assume that it would be a lot of fun to be in a Agreed. big budget movie and have everyone yell your name and snap right. pictures of you. But I think most of us it would be pretty horrifying. For Yet there's no way that you are going to get the general public on. It's like telling someone, hey, there's a lot of stress being a football player and making millions of dollars. Now, we all know that there is, right. but we have no compassion for anybody in that position. Yeah, we just have jealousy. And you think, uh, let's let's take them down from there. You know what I mean? You right. hold them up, and then we yank them down. But I like anyone bringing any bad press to the Batman versus Superman. That's kind of fun for me. <laughs> you but, appreciate that. Yeah, I think it's it's good because I remember when everyone was mad at Ant-Man and now they're just fucking thrilled that Ant-Man's coming out this week. Now, do you think people people are getting upset that he said that or people understand that he's using a turn of phrase there that Well, I don't I I don't know what people are thinking. I don't follow uh the website superhero hype there might be some but i never see any of those it's like the superhero fans they don't get that mad about things they just want to get their cartoon movie right you know they just want a thumb in their mouth they don't care whose thumb it is i think also it's weird because you, you don't have anything in your personal life that would prepare you for that type of celebrity or that type of experience and yet we always are upset when a uh 
celebrity doesn't handle it the way we think right. is the right way to handle it. We don't even oh, want to hear anything. He didn't take the pictures or he didn't he wasn't warm enough in that moment. Like yeah. how is anyone not just standing there like a deer in headlights like this is really overwhelming and I don't want to speak to any of these people. Um yeah, I think I, well, first of all, I agree with you that we expect them to enjoy every minute of every day, pose for every picture, sign everything, and we base ourselves on that. It's like somebody could be a great actor, and then you find out that they didn't sign a kid's picture, and you get mad. I'll, I'll give you, I think it's up on the iBank today, the Johnny Depp. I go to the Johnny Depp thing, and this is what Johnny Depp uh, does in his spare time. Go ahead and hit play, please. Thank you. Now, you see him walking into a hospital. And please turn, yeah, turn up the volume, please. Yes! This is a little girl. You can see her head shaved. And he's coming in full costume. And here's a little girl who's going through chemo. Yes! <laughs> Niagara Falls, Frankie Angel. Hospital. Now, as mad as we can get as comic book movies, right? Yes. Look at the joy that he's bringing. Santa Claus type joy. Yeah. Santa Claus type joy. And by the way, the guy who is his henchman is being such a great wingman. Yeah. Not, of, of only being there to compliment Depp and point right. at him and stuff like, he's the one. <laughs> and not make him feel Look weird. at this little kid. Aww. So sick. And getting all this love and joy from Depp. We'll never know what it's like to, you know. To have that effect on. Yeah, to have that effect on. Turn it up a little bit. Did you smile? No, you didn't. No, you didn't smile at all. I did. You did not smile. I did. All right, I smiled too. I have no idea what this thing is i have in me so hand. it's just adorable that he's in there ball busting he like little kids going through chemo and stuff and instead of saying you can make it he's just in there being a pirate <laughs> you didn't smile you know what i mean like right. no one probably treats the kid right. like that it's amazing uh here's mona up in washington hey mona hey how's it going i really calling because he's at an event i mean wouldn't you expect him to be understanding of people screaming his name and I mean, I could have said if he's in his house no, like, in his garage. Just like I said, there's we as people have never had anything at that level. Why would you assume that somebody would know how to behave normal? What would even be normal? How, what would be a normal reaction to thousands of people screaming your name and saying everything at once? And yeah, so it's he's just, starring in one of the you know biggest movies. He, at an event, it'd be different. Like I said, if he was at his house. So, but what would you, how would you like him to movie. react? Um, wave, smile. Then maybe if he didn't feel comfortable, get get out. <laughs> See, this is the thing. We expect people to understand how to handle that when it's an overwhelming thing right. to handle, particularly for a guy like Jesse Eisenberg, who came into this world to kind of be an actor. Right. More than, you know, the way. Superstar, yeah. I mean, we would think that it was great, but it's the way people treat Mickey Mouse, and we consider that a fucking $10 an hour job. Right. Even you know? somebody who's been working uh, in film since he was young would not even prepare you for that level of attention. I mean, this is somebody who has been working in film. He's right. writes has been writing plays. You know what I mean? Like, he's not. Yeah an unknown person and he's been doing it for a long time. There's nothing at that and level that could New York, right? <laughs> yeah, Where people exactly. are going to stop you. Um, Already. Let's go over here to Eric. Eric, what's up, buddy? Hey, buddy. Hey, uh, my wife works at the airport here in Denver and she sees celebrities all the time, you know, maybe with their families or they're doing something and they're dressed down. You know, they, most people wouldn't even recognize them a lot of times. And she really finds it amazing how rude the general public is to some of these celebrities. They'll run up to them and, you know, maybe somebody will recognize them, they'll run up to them, want an autograph or a picture. And the celebrity's like, look, I'm with my family. How about cutting me some slack here? And she's actually watched people say, God, I can't believe how rude you are. And the people are like, 
I'm with my family. You know, I, I'd like occasionally I want some time without you being in my face. Well, you, you know, know, I first of all, I would get that, except for I just yelled at Mark Rivera yesterday <laughs> on the street, who is a great sax player, played with Foreigner, played with Billy Joel. The problem is I had him on the show before, so as I soon as someone I'm like, hey, like I saw someone from work, right. but then I thought to myself, fuck, I'm stopping this dude. I I quickly, you know, went, all right, thanks, dude, see you around, <laughs> You're, you well, know, but I thought to myself, I never do that. You, you know, know, one of the one of the stories my wife was telling me one time is um, Ian Zering. Um, he, she happened to run into him one day. Most people wouldn't have even known him. He was just dressed so casually. And, you know, it was just out of the blue. My wife recognized him, and she said, oh, you know, I love you as such and such. And he said, thanks. My wife didn't ask for his autograph or anything know, like that. I know. That. That's the best and thing he, to do is don't break stride. Um, yeah. Because I... Uh, I actually, I did it to Richard Dreyfus a couple of times, and I'm trying to think of the actress. She used to be ma she used to be married to Steven Spielberg in the early '80s. Uh, I did a line at a movie of her and never broke stride, and never fucking turned around. I mean, sometimes it's impossible not to make a connection, and I realize that, but there's a difference between just wanting to have your moment or saying, like, hey, I really appreciate you or yeah, something, and just, moving on. Well, but I, to berate somebody or, like, to be obsessive and then be upset at their reaction to that? Yeah. To be I remember who it was. It was Amy Irving, and I was just, she was walking one way on Central Park West, I'm on the other, and I go like this, my job doesn't represent who I am, and just kept going, because it was from this fucking great <laughs> movie <laughs> Peter Rieger had said it to her because she liked him but found out that he was a pickle man but he was like really cool pickle now, did man did she react to you saying I don't know I never turned around I just kept right on going <laughs> you know and then like, I just wanted her to call her agent going hey is that is crossing Delancey bigger than we thought or was it on cable last night um Monty I hope it's Monty Love yeah Hey, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, he must be a nice guy. He's cool and everything, because uh, he wouldn't be going and doing that stuff uh, if he wouldn't get paid to doing it on his own. So he's not doing it just because he's getting paid. And people say, you know, he well, would be it's part of your that. deal now when you do a movie. Most of these people who do a movie, they uh, have to, um, they got to do a lot of stuff. All right, you do have to, our team put it together. Uh, only took, what was it, an hour? Hour and a half. Hour and a half to say you do have to sign up for Anthony Comia dot com uh, tonight uh, to see the roast, the big Jay Okerson. And I imagine quite a bit of it's going to be about his new found fame of fighting with an 82 year old <laughs> man. I always feel like, you know, the way Jay was talking about, I always kind of feel for people when they, you know, been in the game too long and then instead of getting, you know, respect or being told to hang yeah. on to the water wagon you know what i mean <laughs> hang on to the water wagon there old timer hmm? why from the movie the natural <laughs> for some reason they act like he was a big rummy <laughs> you ever notice that they just act like that old man is the drunkest drunk i see all you other motherfuckers <laughs> drinking everybody here is having a drink and yet i'm taking the fucking heat nobody says rummy anymore i wish they did Maybe, yeah, it's, it's true. maybe not enough people are drinking rum. Too maybe bad. that's the problem. And then you need to get back in the islands. It's the only drink. <laughs> no one ever orders a Jameson's in fucking Jamaica. I think Stanley would. For some reason, you feel like it's too hot to drink brown liquor when you're in the islands. You must have your rum. <laughs> It'll thicken the blood. You know, even though I'm a full-grown man, give me a big old boat drink. <laughs> uh, <laughs> umbrella in it. And a crazy straw. Mm -hmm. Some and fruit. I, yeah, I want it the size of an aquarium. Even though it's the same amount of vodka as you would give me if I was drinking something small. <laughs> what do you have in the blue dye department? And I want it to be slushy. Mm -hmm. It has to have a, 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 a certain amount of slush uh, to it. Um, all right, this is an interesting one. The millennials say... They would quit their jobs if they couldn't check social media. Now, 
uh, this came up for football players that they would have a break every 20 minutes. They'd right. have five minutes of themselves so they could check their tweets. Stanley became outraged because of that. But let's just go around here. Do you check your social media during the show? I have. Emails. Haven't. Twitter I, or whatever. I try Facebook. to wait till breaks, but I do check it at work. You yeah. check it during the show, not even just work the time that you're here while the show's no, on. No, I don't check social media during the show ever. Never commercials. I do on break, but I would never. That's what I'm saying. That's during the show uh, right. in this business. Stanley? Yes. Uh, Joey? I'll check emails, but not social media. You'll check emails, but not so. I didn't even know you were on Twitter. No, I'm not on Twitter. Okay, so I, you don't have, you yeah, just have Facebook. I just have Facebook, yeah. The Facebook or the, Facebook? I lost the the. Oh, see, I didn't. I still stay <laughs> with it. I keep it. Because nice. I was there first. Uh, let's check with Dan Perlman. Is he one to check his social media while at work? Yeah, I, I've checked it at work, yeah. All right, now, um, now we're going to go to Anthony, who I have a feeling is a no. Because he's so conservative Italian. First of all, I don't believe that you weren't it that unmasked the other day. Because it was almost like Anthony was on stage with me, wasn't it? <laughs> Do you check your social media during the show? Uh, just Gmail, that's it. Yes, that's, I think, that's is part. I think that's yeah. it. Yeah. So every single person does. So you could either fight about it. Or do what we do here of like, yeah, do it a commercial or don't do it, you right. know, when you're supposed, but why not just let people do that? Why are we making a big deal about that? I'm sure uh, s schools have had to modify their take on it because I know there were not many people who had cell phones when I was in high school. It was not, you know, obviously there was no smartphones, but some right. people had cell phones, some people didn't, and the rules were strict about it. And but I think that you couldn't have that anymore. Not not at the level where you're trying to completely eradicate it. I don't. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think you could not. And I think I I would have to guess, but I bet parents would be uncomfortable with the idea of being out of contact. We're so in contact with each would other. Would you expect to be able to send something to the child during the school day? I bet some parents would be more comfortable if they were able to connect that way. Since we're we're so used to being able to do it at every other time. So you agree with this? You agree with the millennials more than the offices of yes, you you've got to be able to check social media. Yeah, because I think you there isn't a job that exists right now where you're not going to need access to your email. I mean, most jobs you would need access to your email and what are you going to say? Like lock your apps all, you know, I just don't but think it's all, anything. Of us, all of us know that it's almost like nose picking. Like we get that right. it's not good for us or the people around us yet. We do it anyway. That's the thing that gets to me. Right. And still you can't pick your nose. Yeah. Which actually does have a function despite what people think. There's plenty of times you just can't blow and blow and blow and clear your nostrils. Dig that thing out. Yeah. <laughs> and yet, that would be a faux pas that we could probably have someone fired here for, <laughs> or at least taken off the show, where I could go to Don and say, look, Joe won't keep his finger out of his nose. But if he's using his phone, like Don would probably be just like, well, keep it down under the desk so nobody can right. see you with it. Be discreet, you know? please. Yeah, be a little discreet with it. But we hate that we do it, yet we know, like, I would never think of setting up Something like that, knowing that I that the people couldn't control, and it would force them to do something that they right. that they promised me that they wouldn't like. If I said I don't want any of you guys touching your fucking phones during the show, you're either going to do it anyway, or hate me so much that you end up thinking about that right. during the show. I'm just like whatever, right? But just do your job, and and also so much uh, value is being put on social media in the workplace so everybody has a social media presence so i think it would be bizarre to ask someone not to be in touch with it because most people want they want to know hey uh, what what's everyone on twitter saying about our mayonnaise or whatever you know and i don't know if anyone is you know what i mean yeah. like i think a lot of, i look i think if you're like a record company or a movie company <laughs> Or even a radio company, it makes sense. 
but Hellman's <laughs> having a Twitter. Friends, what are some of their more recent tweets? Okay. Um, in just 20 minutes, these amazing turkey paninis can be yours to devour. And there's a recipe for their mayonnaise Send and turkey. Mm, right. How many great. followers do they have there? 23,000. 23,000 people <laughs> have decided to follow Hellman's, I guess because they get free gift cards or something, probably. Yeah. And then you they, can they, always win. You can right. bitch also to them. They'll answer back and... And there's always someone like Joe who's lying to them, like, I'll be your new social media director. And, you know, he's younger, so they're like, hey, he's got us some follows. He, so, he understands this. We're out of touch. He gets yeah, it. He gets it. He <laughs> tweeted out a picture of a sandwich <laughs> earlier today that just said, mm, Hellman's, and it got some likes. Well, they got a retweet here for Tamara. Sarah saying, ooh, that looks delish. That's all she's saying. Retweet that. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's just like, there's a vine of them making a sandwich. <laughs> all right, let's do this. Why don't, why don't we tweet them right now and just say, say, say something like, how much Hellman's should I put on a ham and cheese sandwich? <laughs> let's just see if they even slightly take it seriously. Just looking for a recommendation. Yeah. On quantity. Right. What is it on Twitter? It's just Hellman's? It is at Hellman's. Yeah. <laughs> Hellman's. So just write to them, like, what's the best mayonnaise or... <laughs> How much should I yeah. put on a ham and cheese sandwich? Can I, just also write this. I, I want to come up with a couple. All right. Tell me when you... Yeah. Just say, could mayonnaise ever be a dip? And see if they... <laughs> <laughs> I hope that they get back to you. Yeah. With some good ideas on that. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, you could do stuff like, do you mix it in the egg salad or is it better just to put on the bread and put the dry egg salad down? Yeah, I never know. Do you just chop up the boiled eggs? Yeah. And then mayonnaise your bread? I think you can use it as a verb. You could actually even say, my child uh, accidentally tasted some helmets. Is it okay? <laughs> Save for children. I'm only kidding about that. That'll get them to get, call a doctor. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Save for children. <laughs> I got some helmets in my eye. What do I do? <laughs> Should I flush it out with water? Do I need to call poison control? <laughs> Is my eyes not in any pain? I just want to make sure. <laughs> Feels good, actually. Um, tell them I got an idea for a commercial, too. There's just a bunch of guys standing around, right? Yeah. And you just walk up and go, what the hell, mans? And oh, then, perfect. Bo- yeah. And then, boom. Fucking spot over. See, now you can see the value of using social media. Work, see the value? I don't know how I lived without it. Um... Here is uh, John, North Carolina. Hey, Bennington's. Hey, man. Ron, I spoke to you a few weeks ago. I work in a rock quarry in the drilling and blasting industry. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, we had a uh, an employee that, that died um, because he was on a phone and he wasn't paying attention to what he was doing. So the, the company put out a memo saying anybody who has a phone on property, whether it's on or off, if you get caught with a phone, you will be terminated. In a four-month period, they fired six people. They just cannot live without the phone. I think what I would do if I was at that thing is say, this is when the phone break is. You know what I mean? Right. Like, do what the football team did, and that way people go, in another 25 minutes, I can check my text. Yeah, here's a safe time to check your phone. Here's the times when you should not be checking. Because if you have to fire six people over something, you know, obviously it's not reaching. Not reaching the people. I, I think that for the industry that I work in, a five-minute phone break can be too dangerous as well. It's just a too dangerous of a place to have a phone. Maybe they uh, should even get rid of the job. You know what I mean? Like it sounds like it's just a really dangerous job. The rock quarry. I'd rather see you work in social media. Um, uh, so would I. All right, we we're getting this over to them. How much mayo should I put on my recipe for the too much tuna? fish salad you know what i mean <laughs> and too much sounds like it is too much yeah but too much tuna is gonna need 
a lot of mayo. Does it need too much mayo, though? <laughs> That's my question. I'd say it's just enough for too much. Right. You know what I mean? You want to you wanna match it. Um, also send them a thing that said, just started putting food coloring in my mayo. Having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait for St. Pat's. Because we never get different colored, you know? Yeah. I mean, they they tried it with ketchup. Well, I've got an idea for a new mayonnaise. I call it mayo and chives. Perfect. Now, what I do is take delicious almonds mayonnaise and put chives in it. It's so know? good. It's chivy. Yeah. And that way you can use it for different sandwich spreads oh, or whatever you like yeah, to do. Yeah, sure. Anything you want to put mayonnaise on. Yeah. Which is most things. <laughs> it's delicious. It is great. Also, right back to him. I left my uh, mayonnaise out in the sun yesterday. Is it still good? Is that is that bad to do? Is it bad to leave mayonnaise in the sun? I keep my mayo in the trunk of my car. <laughs> is that recommended? <laughs> it's just going down with these tweets. I know. Is that bad? I also, write to them this too. <laughs> Just watched Officer and, and a Gentleman. They called Richard Gere Mayo. It reminded me of you. <laughs> Hashtag gotta say it. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag got it. Also, right, they say you don't need to refrigerate. Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> Is that you? Yeah. Then just send one that just says thank God for Hellman's. All right, thank God for, at Hellman's, thank, or just thank God for at Hellman's. Oh, I like that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Consolidating. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, I also got an idea for. <laughs> got a lot of tweets. Tom, I got an idea for a Hellman's helmet, um, and I want to do a remake of Hogan's Heroes called Hellman's Heroes. Hellman's. And just right. Hellman's hel helmet. Don't forget that. Yeah. Got it. But Tom, it's going to be uh, Hogan's heroes, except for this time it's Hellman's heroes. Hashtag this time the Germans win. Hmm. Just see if that if they're still on board with it. I'm going to see. So I think they hashtag will. this time the Germans win. Mm -hmm. it's confused. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know what? Maybe leave off that hashtag. <laughs> I All right, right back to Hellman's, would you? Tom, I had a nightmare last night that the only spread was Miracle Whip, and I woke up screaming and pissing <laughs> my... <laughs> I woke up in a cold sweat screaming. They're just like, I don't know. I told you this thing was going to catch on. We're getting a hammer. Look at our mentions. <laughs> what are they again? At Hellman's. At Hellman's. I mean, it's a great product. Love oh, I it. love it. It's delicious. <laughs> it's the only mayo to me. Oh, yeah. Uh, I agree. I'll walk out if it's not Hellman's. <laughs> I'll walk out. There are some products like that where you can't go off brand. Mayonnaise and Hellman's, that's one of them. Uh, that might be my most important one, too. Yeah. You don't mess with other mayonnaise brands. You no. just don't. And let's face it. You can get away with a lot of mustards. You might not like oh, them yeah. as much. Yeah. You're going to have preferences. But that whip that you mentioned, I'll, I could know it anywhere, and I'll spit it. Actually, I'm the one who mentioned it. I had a Fight Club right, moment you did. where I thought that <laughs> Who there was... Who are you talking to? <laughs> <laughs> Stanley, he's losing it. I what am should Jack's, we do? I am Jack's love for helmets. <laughs> Put a hashtag in front of that. Right. Yeah. yeah, hashtag Hellman's is like Fight Club. <laughs> no, don't hashtag oh, that. Okay. It actually takes two brands, puts it together, and confuses everybody. <laughs> Both good brands, though. Good is the name of the word for it, my friend. I don't know why we got talking about them having a social media site. Uh, but it's weird. We all agree. Let people use their phones instead of making it better. Tom Petty has apologized for his Confederate flag uh, backdrop that he used for so many years. Remember when people were so offended by the flag? And I said... I saw Petty so many times right. with that, and it never I never thought one way about it. And he's like, it was stupid. 
I had 30 years of being stupid. But I do think that he came he came to that conclusion on his own. It wasn't in reaction to uh, all this that was going on. He had, but, he had kind of distanced himself from the Confederate flag for a while. Well, let me tell you something, though. And I, I think this is when he started using it. You ever listen to the Southern accents? It's mm -hmm. that album is like the southern people as victims themselves right it's like yeah. it's about them being mocked for being southern it's about living in a world where the you know that's not the first atlanta you know what i mean there was another atlanta before we have the one now um Who just sent me this crazy Hellman's thing? I people are now just texting it to me. <laughs> That's um, not how Twitter works. Making love to my wife last night couldn't finish, so I threw Hellman's on her back. You think she knew? <laughs> I have no idea who sent this to me. <laughs> it's just a phone number. There's there. a phone number. How do you have his number? <laughs> All right, I got to go get uh, my phone number changed because this is definitely a killer that sent Did this. Did you to me. tweet that out? <laughs> Did you just tweet out my number, Chris? No. Nope. Stanley, why did you do that? <laughs> you were you're supposed wrote, to be tweeting to Hellman. Here's my number if you need it. There's a southern accent. So the. Uh, the Thanks for trying to drown me out. That's a fucking important thing to do in this business. <laughs> I listen to Southern accent. Here, this is better than you. It's like yesterday when Joe's character was my character. I know. With the same name. Twins. Attitude and motivations. You had so much in common. Um, but, you know, shit never sticks to Petty. He's fine. No. You don't he, have to worry about He'll be all right. He, you know, Kid Rock, shit sticks to him no matter what he does. Oh, yeah. That's part of his thing. Um, the, the, there's a, up on the iBang, a behind the scenes of Tom Cruise, new Mission Impossible stunt, where he is actually hanging on the outside of a plane, the way I told you. You, you were the one who said, it's really him, and I could not believe it. Oh, all right, so listen, all right, we have to guess who wrote, by the way, making love to my wife last night, couldn't finish, so I threw helmets on her back. Okay. I'll just tell you this. We know this person, okay, and we know his wife. Okay, Good I'm. Guess. I'm gonna have a Rich guess. Voss. Rich Voss is the. Oh my God! Stanley made sure we didn't have fun with it. He got right to it. We <laughs> never thought I'd ever be right before. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the game is over. Oh, it's so there's many knock, guesses. There's a knockout in the first round on the first punch. Didn't see that coming. <laughs> Usually, um, the opposite of that. Wrong every single time without fail. <laughs> no, you got it. Feel good about yourself. All right, let's uh, take all the party supplies back oh, in. Oh, no! It's not happening. I was so excited Fuck. to guess. Last night, there was a whole thing lined up for Knock Knock. They put a house out yeah. front, and uh, Ryan Seacrest was there. And then we went back out a half an hour later, and everything was taken apart. You were just yeah. like, why do we do things in show business? The thing that... I felt bad as you know, like 20 people worked on that. They're like, we're calling all the vendors. All right, here's uh, what I feel bad about. Boss knows I never put his number in my phone. I know. You need to save that. Yeah. You need me to do that for you? <laughs> no. I don't, I, I don't know if you know how to do it. Just, I know you don't understand social media. I know how to do it. Just is here to do it for me. Anyway. That's that's why we all need to be connected. Well, we're saying, why does Hellman's need to have uh, a Twitter? Why do we need to have a Twitter? Everyone they, needs a Tim Twitter. Tim Sabian screamed at me. You gotta have it. It's everything. I never really used it until I started doing the show. I had it for like a little bit. It's necessary. Do you tweet a lot now? No, I don't. Uh, I don't you tweet, a lot. tweet a lot. Put pictures of your house up. Things that you're doing. Uh, your there is a birdie dreams. picture up right now. Is there a nice birdie girl picture? Mm -hmm. There sure is. Are people saying nice things about birdie? How could they not? Walking birdie. Trying to catch me walking birdie. Were you singing that last oh, night? Oh, yeah. Joe, you do that to us. You 
Oh, that's uh, Bernie's new toy? Yes. Who'd that come in from? That's from Larry and Lori and Yonkers and also Elvis, their dog. And they said that they and sent- Bernie loves them. Wow, you have nice hard uh, floors. Yeah. I think nice hardwood. Yeah, that's the perfect New York floor. Mm-hmm. You know? You it's don't want coveted. a carpeting in New York. It's- no, it doesn't work. I also had once an apartment years ago, all linoleum all the way through <laughs> I know, and it's rough but it was it's, a great apartment it, it was a great apartment and no new york apartment is perfect like you're always you're right like you make concessions in a way i think people with actual homes would, would never, never un- dream of would never understand yeah the amount of things that you're weighing out you're like it's a great neighborhood right uh uh, the weird thing is the bathroom is in the kitchen. Under the sink. Yeah. It's under the sink. So it's a little weird, but it's great neighborhood. I used to so think nice. that that was a joke, that sometimes the bathroom was in weird places, but until like the Lower East Side. All and, the railroad apartments yeah. have that. You know that I had a friend who had a railroad house. Yeah. Where his home, and this was in a neighborhood because his dad had built the house. He had to walk through his parents' house. So I had to stumble through what? when we were in high school oh, God. to get in his room. Um. So yeah, yeah. There is always something you're willing to deal with, like Chris is willing to deal with that his apartment will never get fixed. <laughs> yeah, ever for anything. Now, by the way, she was bragging about her uh, cheap apartment today. And yours is still cheaper. Yeah. And yeah. she's talking 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, the That's amazing. Are, it's totally insane here. How much do you pay for an apartment? Seven. 700. 700. 700. When most people say seven, <laughs> they mean thousand. This is the apartment he grew up in. So yeah. he's held right. on to the rent I got forever. My name. Yeah, move and I tell him, matter of fact, somebody wrote to me. Did I forward it to yeah, you? Yeah, you did. Yeah. Because I think it's a dangerous move what you're contemplating right. doing. So you, so you own, you own it. No, 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 no. I'm no, just he's like grandfathered rent- in. Okay, he's rent controlled. Right. So it's as good as owning it, right. Because they can't re- push you out more for than it. what twenty dollars a year or something. Yeah, it's like, and, and like, there was just some new laws. It's like one or two percent from the rent. Right. So that's you know. So <laughs> for the people out around America, him having a place for seven hundred in New York City. Is like you finding a five bedroom house for four dollars a month <laughs> right. in the suburbs, and and most one bedrooms in the outer boroughs, not Manhattan. Obviously, right. we're not talking Manhattan. Is more than double that for a, more than double that for a one bedroom. I don't even know how far out you've got to go, right, to get a fifteen hundred hour one bedroom. You got to go pretty damn far. You're an hour and a half away from this. Uh, no, two hours because Park Slope is an hour and change from the city, and that's two thousand dollars for one bedroom, yep. easily. Now you are one stop from Midtown. Yeah, two two stops from Midtown. All yeah. right, so you're up East Side for a stop. Uh yeah, sixty third, fifty ninth. All right, so you go to fifty ninth and Lex. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then the next stop is Rockefeller Center. Wow. Or no, you got fifty seventh. Yeah, yeah. Then, yeah, then there's like two more stops. So I'm like yeah. four okay. stops away from the from work. That's from- amazing. I have so many millions of stops. <laughs> so many millions. But you know, if you lived in Long Island City, you know, we have, you know, a few stops. And that's why Long Island City blew yeah, up. Yeah, it blew up. The way it did. By the way, anyone who doesn't live 25 miles from us is going, what? <laughs> right. Long Island City? What? I thought Long Island We're just Island. saying you would be better to buy some tools Go to YouTube and figure out how to fucking fix a house up, dude. No, you don't have. You'd be making hundreds of thousands of dollars by doing that. You don't have renters rights that you can say that you have to be able to have somebody come in and fix things for you. They or... could do like the bare, bare minimum, but the bare minimum is still shit. And if, if you let the place go to shit and if they're not doing upkeep. And if well, if if I try to do upkeep, they'd hear me and then come and tell me to stop. They can't tell you not to fucking yeah, you work on your apartment. Blast your fucking stereo and start doing. Stick up for yourself a little bit. They can't get you out. The craziest thing about New York is it takes years to get someone who's not paying rent out. There was a guy in my neighborhood. He was a fucking hoarder. Not only did he cover every fucking bare inch of his apartment, he also had cars and vans out front that he had packed trash in. It was fucking amazing. They couldn't get rid of him. 
They put him on a TV show and they still couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> it takes. I mean, this guy obviously. Look, if you're a hoarder out there, you could probably tell yourself you're not insane, but you are. Right. If you're taking things out of the trash and piling them up into your apartment and not being able to sleep in there, you're sleeping on the fucking fire escape. Right. If you still have mail piled up from the mid 80s, that's not even yours. <laughs> you're just finding mail and you're like, I might need, I need this, this someday. I'm going to need this. It's an old bad statement. See, I understand not cleaning up uh, after yourself, but I don't understand this wording. Right. I, I, I could completely understand I'm going to get to the dish. Right. Stop bringing it up to me. Right. Might you know, get some more cereal later, and I don't want to get another. <laughs> <laughs> still good. Still usable. All right. Blowhard wants to talk to you and fucking try to straighten your dumb ass out. Oh, I'd he's love the to only, talk to him. He's the only one who can reach you, Chris. Yeah. Blowhard, right. please doing, talk to him. All right. When you live in New York City and you have a rent-stabilized or a rent-controlled apartment, if your apartment is really falling apart, you need a, a the bathroom is the walls are coming down. Whatever whatever problem you have, the landlord has an obligation to fix it. And now it's in his best interest to fix and improve your apartment because they call it in the courts a capital improvement, meaning that if he comes and says, Chris Stanley, I want to to give you a new bathroom, then he could increase the rent a certain percentage. Or if he gives you a new stove or a kitchen, he could increase the rent. So the more he does for you, the more money he can make from you. And if you have a problem, it's against the law for him not to take care of it. Yeah. You got to start to stand up for yourself. In other words, read your lease because. You can't that, do you even my, know where your lease is? Yeah, I know exactly where my lease is. So that's that's my, my most precious thing right now. Because <laughs> you can't live in squalor. He is, though. He's falling he had a fuck, living in squalor? Dude, he had a fucking broken window for years, three years he yeah. wouldn't fix it. I'm like, fix your fucking window. Right. But He's like, see, I can't. The landlord is dumb if he doesn't fix it because he can get more money. My, my landlord put in a new uh, oil burner in the building. And we got a fifteen twenty dollar increase. Um, everything my land. You get yourself an extra fifteen. Yeah. This way. They you raised the it. Too, and, huh? um, it, it, you should really look into this because when people do things on their own, that's wrong. You just can't take a hammer and start knocking down walls. But I do. If you have a decrepit apartment that really has issues, you tell him I need this to be fixed. And chances are, if it's a rent stabilized or rent controlled. He'll have to do it, but then he'll profit. But your whole your whole apartment turned into Yuppie Town, right? Oh, it's, it's, just... it's a co-op filled with it's. There's probably like fifty apartments in there, and there's maybe two rent stable rent, non co-op buildings there. It's all just young. And people. all your neighbors probably hate you. They probably call you a renter, and they have like a smoker, mm -hmm. smoker, smoker's their thing. Yeah, they don't like me. Yeah, because uh, my and, like my landlord got turned down because he built the new front steps outside, a new stoop, as we call it in Brooklyn. And he tried to put in for that for a capital improvement. And he got turned down because it's part of the structure and you need a stoop. But when he put a new bathroom in for me, you know, I, I got an increase. So the longer you're there and the more he does, you'll benefit and then he'll benefit financially. So you should really look into this. Um, maybe if you have a friend who's a lawyer or something, a house, you know, just look into, go to a website, go to New York. Here's house. the thing. I know, come on in, Johnny. Johnny, nobody's lined up to take care of Johnny. Um, I just got the email. Come on, have a say, Johnny. Uh, here's the thing. Chris forgets his lease rights. He doesn't fucking plug my unmasked that are coming up. It's just not something that he's doing. Johnny, let me just tell you this. You look like a million bucks. You do. Thank you. Did you hey, get re-stapled? No, no, I didn't. Because you look fantastic. I just uh, working out, eating right. Right. So you got like more of your stomach taken out <laughs> and oh. some ribs, two kidneys, and a liver. <laughs> no, you, you look fantastic. No. I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, it's been a long while. I don't yeah. know why. Well, uh, by the way, Blowhard's here. He wants to say... Blowhard. He wants you to tell that story about Rhode Island, how you used to go out to the truck, <laughs> that sandwich you used to get. No, no. How crazy all you and your friends were. Yeah, Johnny had a voracious appetite for What's the this? grease trucks, I remember. That, I did. Those uh, violet candies. Least favorite candies. All right, I'm going to try one. on my first day. I don't... Being here with Gail. 
Uh, it was, uh, let me just say it's this. one of the candies we discussed. I don't even know that they make something like this anymore. They do. I, there's this cool little uh, ice cream place by my house down the shore that has like all these vintage candies. Although these you could find the scented gum, which is in that. What's the name of this? Violets? Yeah. It violets. has no color to it. <laughs> it's clear. And look, there's a chalkiness <laughs> that doesn't exist in today's candy world. It seems like it's been laying... No, it's an interesting. Perf- it smells like a grandma. Have you had one of these before? This I don't first- remember ha- ever having this. Good luck. <laughs> I'm going to do it, even though I've had one before. But oh, the God. taste of that, I'll do one too. It's like, oh god, so it's you- like a urinal pop. Yeah, yeah. Throw it over <laughs> so- here. I've never had one. So yeah, Ooh. it's shocking, it disgusting. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think it smells disgusting, but it smells like. Something that you wouldn't consider food. I'm throwing the laundry. <laughs> you spit it out? No, you. you just spit it out like a baby. <laughs> a baby. Dude, <laughs> t- take another one so you can... Oh, he just tried to eat up the already eaten one. You don't want to be a man who spits things out. Uh, no. All right, Blower, talk to you later, buddy. Like vomit. One t- question. Yeah. Razzles, a gum or a candy? Uh, it's a gum. I go with gum. I say it's both. It it's becomes a gum. Um, it ends a gum. Ends a gum. It does end oh, a gum. Oh, God, this is so bad. <laughs> there was actually a contest when I was a kid that you could write in whether Razzles is a gum or a candy. And they had the kids in my elementary school were part of it. And kids wrote it for fucking pages about how it's both and everything. And I just wrote gum and handed <laughs> it in. And then, like, six weeks later, I found out I won a mini bike. Oh, nice. And just, <laughs> was this you really, were right. It was, yeah, I was right. It was just like a little lawnmower engine on the, on this tiny little bike that you would ride around in. They had those down the shore this weekend at one of the... Like, I know, you got a fucking the, shore house, Johnny. I know. <laughs> you bring it up constantly. You bring it up more than I do. What are you doing, crabbing again this weekend? I might. It's starting to get the season. Let me tell you, for the folks out there that are not familiar with Hard Rock Johnny, he is the guy in New York City and has been at the Hard Rock, which sometimes we could forget because we're used to the Hard Rock. But what a strange and successful concept that is. That's why Chris Stanley... You're going to present Johnny with something right now. Johnny's part of the Innovators of Entertainment segment brought to you by Tito's Handmade Vodka. Tito's Handmade Vodka is America's original craft vodka distilled six times from 100% corn and naturally gluten-free. Handcrafted to be savored responsibly. We were thinking about that when you were on the way over here. I go, you know, the, the Hard Rock, because I remember when the Hard Rock came to New York. Now, if you're a certain age, you just think of the Hard Rock as a, you know, it's just always been there as a thing. But I remember the heat of when the Hard Rock, which was a London establishment, came to New York City and L.A. about the same time, right? L.A. was a year and a half before. It was actually Toronto, L.A., then New York. And, you know, celebrities would show up more than just people who were hard. Like, it was like, can you think you can get me into the Hard Rock on 57th Street? <laughs> the uh, See if you know this one, Johnny. Famous bouncer on 57th Street in the 80s. Well, he wasn't a famous bouncer. He's a famous movie star now. Vince D'Onofrio. That's right. Is that right? Yeah, he was the guy. I did not know that. Yeah. One of our guys still... We have we have two actually original day one Hard Rock New York employees who work for us. Jeff is one of them. He's a, he's one of, he's a doorman, and he worked with Vincent. And then we have Juan, who is a bartender. He actually put the first bottle on the back bar. Like, I don't even know when. We're, we're going to be 10 years in Times Square. So I think we're at 37, 30 years plus in, in New York City. I remember the first time I went in on, uh, on 57th Street, which is gone now, right? Yeah, the building, yeah. the building, the building is, is gone. gone. It's nothing there. It's yeah. gone so they can put in another yeah, giant 180 thin story. building. And I remember Johnny saying, we're leaving 57th. And I remember the first time I went into 57th, years before I met Johnny, I felt like, you know, I'm in Rock and Roll Central right now. This is what it feels like. And your head was on a swivel to see if Rod Stewart would come by. But when he said, we're leaving 57th Street and we're going to (laughs) Times Square, I go, worst mistake you ever made. People will not find you there. You're going to lose everything that you have here on 57th Street. That thing became giantly successful the first day. And every time I walk in there, it's packed. It's nutty, right? And right now we're like mid nutty season. It's like 
you know, July, August is pretty much, you know, tourist central and it's, it's great. We love, you know, the people come in, they check out some famous pants. They but have what, a hamburger. Sure. But, but Johnny, is it about rock and roll that they come there still? Is it the memorabilia? Is it the food? Is the experience? Because it's that, crazy to me that it's still there. I think it's, you know, our guests come in because it's a piece of New York. I think that, you know, you get the shirt that says you were in New York, kind of validates your trip to the city. And you go in because, you know, look, we have good food. We have a good atmosphere. You can hear some good music. You could obviously, as you always point out, see famous pants. Although we do have some famous shirts and guitars as well. All right, who started Hard Rock for Real? It uh, was started by Peter Morton mm -hmm. and Isaac Tigret uh, in 1971. They were in England. And they, they wanted to have a place to get American food. And it was modeled after a truck stop. And then the way the memorabilia thing started was Clapton was a regular there. He always wanted a place to get a good burger. He was burger. the first. And this, wow. this story is, is documented by the two guys that, that are a part of it. Clapton wanted to signify his seat. So he gave a guitar and said, could you put this on the wall? And they did. And less like a week, maybe two weeks later, a gentleman who was in a band named The Who... Decided to send a guitar as well, so now they had the two of them. He says, "If his is good enough, it was enough, their so ideas, not the founders." Correct. Right. They put them up, and then from there, Hard Rock kind of ran with it, started collecting memorabilia, and you know, it just went from there. And now it's you know, uh, one of probably I would say probably the biggest collection of rock and roll memorabilia in the world. Well, I think when they had two, it probably was like no one thought to <laughs> yeah. themselves yeah, back then. Yeah, yeah, no one thought in those days. Oh, these things are historical. Everything about rock and roll felt like today would be like you saving an email or something. It right. just didn't feel like it was going to have any shelf life. And that was considered like one of the cool things about it. Like this is right. today. And it know? was the music of young people. So there was nothing to be nostalgic about. Right. And point. you weren't like, oh, our children are going to like this too. Right. Because you weren't thinking about children. You weren't thinking about future generations. All right. So those two guitars go up, which are probably... Even to this day, if you were going to start a collection, right. <laughs> those two guitars would be two to start with. And these, and this is the interesting thing. They wanted to eat cheeseburgers like they were in America. Because think of a world of this in 71. You couldn't get a cheeseburger in London. It didn't exist. And Hard Rock wanted to become the first classless restaurant and and. Not in the way that most people would think, but you, you could achieve that. <laughs> Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what you you couldn't go into a restaurant in England and find a banker and a baker in the same place. It was kind of a class system. Hard Rock wanted to be classless. They wanted to. You could find the butcher, the baker. You could find the banker. Candlestick all, maker. Yeah, him too. He was there. Um, so, and we still have working for us the first. And I think you met Rita. Rita I was did. the first person first waitress hired by hard rock still works for us uh as our cultural uh, ambassador she was given the mbe which is equivalent to being knighted but but girl you know ladies are not knighted and she's also not english um she's she's irish and so they she holds the mbe for her um what she's done for culture and tourism in the united kingdom so you know it's 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 a kind of it's a cool history i mean it's uh it's, well it's a yeah it's a phenomenal history and again People don't even realize it about London and, and rock and roll changed that where you could move up a class. That's why you always see those early, you know, when the Stones or, or Paul McCartney got money, they moved out of London into some <laughs> weird, you right. know, place outside of London. You know, uh, Zeppelin was famous for these big, stupid houses because they didn't know any other way to act. With money, they were like, "Well, I guess I'll I'll be out there and I'll have servants and shit." They didn't know what to do. Castles, it, yeah, because no one had ever moved up. No one ever right. got money who hadn't already had money in their family. Um, but I think it's really interesting that those guys came to uh, America, kind of fell for some stuff, and now a lot of them like are upset about it. Clapton said. Why tour? Everything looks like America. Ray Davies has written songs about how the world looks like America now, you know? And it is kind of weird that we succeeded in pushing a, a culture on the, wor on the world that was maybe faster, easier and shit. But now their old cultures are gone. Even some of the stuff that maybe wasn't so nice. 
Yeah. They miss a little bit. Yeah, I I think that it would be hard not to find uh, or to, uh, hard to find a place that didn't have those touchstones that you could say, oh, this I know. I've been to one of these. Well, like anywhere you, you could travel. Could you imagine traveling anywhere in the world now and somebody didn't take your credit card <laughs> or they don't speak English? And you're like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You're in Uganda. Why aren't you <laughs> speaking English? And send me up uh, scrambled eggs and bacon for breakfast. <laughs> How that's I what like. we eat in Maryland. <laughs> that's what we eat in Maryland. So I expect it everywhere. Um, I'll tell you, I always remember this too about the hard rock in America. That became an early hangout place and would always make the magazines for Brat Packers. Brat Packers were always Is that in right? the hard rock. Yeah. They got called, I think, the Brat Pack when they were at the, at the hard rock because they were holding court. In there, they were, you know, bigger than life, and they were, what, 22 or 23, right. <laughs> you know? I had no idea that that was, uh, that was their place. Yeah, and then, because after that name came out, they actually stayed away from each other. They didn't want to be seen, because anytime there Don't was Don't want to be Brad Pack. Look, Brad Pack, <laughs> Brad Pack, you just, like, forget it. I hate that name. Uh, Johnny, did you put, put up the eye bang? Uh, did you see this? It's new pictures of Amy Schumer. I guess it's GQ. Yeah, it's is GQ. What this is, and um, let's check this out. Oh, Big J Okerson is also up in a big, big way. Mm-hmm. New bouncer. Yeah, he is the new bouncer. <laughs> A good story. The video of him is well. The story was much better than the video. Oh yeah, I, I mean, really, video, just his yeah. presence alone was enough. Yeah, it was he nice, put, but he looked too friendly and nice. He put a me. paw on him. Yeah, <laughs> that's all it needed. That uh, roast is up tonight on the uh, AnthonyCumia dot com. Uh, AnthonyCumia dot com will be part of that. Uh, thanks for getting that started early. So there's the picture of Amy. Sucking on the finger of, I guess, is that three CPO? C three PO. What did I? What did I call him? Three CPO. And what's the difference? C three PO. The C before the three. So I'm dyslexic (laughs) when it comes to sci-fi. So she's sucking on the finger of him, and a little more breasty than I remember Princess Leia. Yeah, she is everywhere. This week. That's why we refuse to promote it, but I'm going to say it now. We're doing the train wreck takeover weekend starting Friday. Friday during our show. And Gail and I, we've never done this before. We're DJing stand up comedy where we just throw it to clips of all the guys. Nobody does that. I feel I mean, like we're going to get the house dancing. <laughs> in a lot of ways, I think we're innovators. I mean, I don't know, you know. We're, Take away maybe from, we don't even no, need Johnny no. here. To, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Johnny, are you going over for the big concert this uh, summer? Is that happening? I am. I am actually, but this year it is in Barcelona. You're home be, away from home. Yes. Who's second. the headliner? Uh, we have Lenny Kravitz one night, and the other night is Robbie Williams. Which and nice. uh, we also have. Uh, let's see. There's there's DJ sets of each as one night. Um, so it, apparently the concerts go to like four in the morning there. It's outdoors on the beach. You're not pulling the plug this year like you no, did this that was stage. That was last night was the, was the three year anniversary and the show was, I was listening to E Street Radio and it said on the little, on the pad date, it said Hard Rock Calling 2012. I'm like, oh, there it is. And I, I, about 1030, I started to conk out. I'm like, I gotta stay up to hear the plug get pulled on Springsteen again. And, and you know what happened? It got pulled again. And I will say it was one of our guys who did it. I love the fact that you go to sleep listening to East Street Radio. That's about not as, often. That's about as Jersey as a person can get. Ah, oh, some nice lullabies uh, tonight. <laughs> so comforting. Everybody in Jersey loves Bruce. Mm-hmm. We do Johnny more than most. Favorite Bruce Springsteen song. You know, I and I hate to be the guy Jungle Land only because I love the Clarence Clements sax that that interlude in that's the middle. That's the only part of the song I don't like. I like oh. everything but that. <laughs> I loved. I love that was. I will never. That's one of my greatest concert moments ever. The first time I got to see him do it live. I. Uh, you know what my favorite uh, Clarence Clements thing is? Clarence Clements came in here. And we were playing Tenth Avenue Freeze Out for him, right? Because uh-huh. it's like when the big man joined the band. And then he comes in, he starts singing. 
I'm not even thinking. Me, I just start singing along with them. <laughs> right. I when it gets to like when the big man joined the band, I was I was pointing at him, <laughs> and he like had his hands in the air. <laughs> and then I went, "Oh shit! What am I? This is fucking crazy. Right. <laughs> I'm acting like I'm his friend because I've seen him, but he never saw me all right. that time. I'm <laughs> Who much is this more, guy? Yeah, I'm much more <laughs> comfortable with him because you don't feel like when Clarence would come yeah. in. It, it, you know, you you just felt like, oh, a big huggable person came in. Uh, all right, I'm going to go to you. Favorite Springsteen? Oh, uh, Darkness on the Edge of Town. See, you don't even have any. I, I, no. I've never listened to Bruce Springsteen. All right, let's go over. Favorite Frank Joe. Dancing in the Dark. Boy, you guys are single boys. Ouch. Screen door slams. Mm-hmm. Mary's dress waves. Mm-hmm. That's, that's my, a good one. That's my favorite. Uh, you and uh, you and uh, Johnny are off the same exact album too. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go one, and I just played this when my friend died. Spirits in the night. Love That's that where I am right now. Mm-hmm. I'm not always that. It's you know, it's I true. move around a little. Any bit. good artist, you do move around. You like your your I favorite song true. will. I love some of the some of the stuff off the rising, just based off of the time period and yeah, what was happening. Like so heartbreaking, city of ruin, like those kind yeah. of songs. Still, when you get them, you get that kind of chill inside. Just if you, especially if you were in this area that time, you know, yeah, it was it was amazing. I mean, you, you do go kind of back and forth though with with artists, I think, and that's when you have an artist you love. I never thought that that uh, you know I changed. Like if someone said, "What's your favorite Doors song?" I, real quick, Soul Kitchen. Joey. Okay. So many. Pe- Johnny. Pe- the end. People are strange. Really? When, yeah, but it moves. It moves for me. Mine too. is Love Street and says always stay right. that. <laughs> That's how it goes. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't realize I that. I thought you were going to jump in. <laughs> she lives on <laughs> Set <Love> you up. <laughs> Street. You know, the doors are one of those things where you act like you're Morrison. Because everyone can pretty much. <laughs> well, I guess that. I like it fine. So, so far. far. Well, I see you live on Love Street. There's a store there. Where the creatures meet eye. You know, this is strange. Wonder what they do in there. Uh, uh, Jim, I don't think you understand where the commas go in this. Uh, <laughs> we're going to do it again, but try not pausing <laughs> in the middle of places. You've got to pay attention to that punctuation, all right? I got in trouble for doing a report on the doors in like fifth grade because I decided that I should put that he was arrested for lewd and lascivious activities, and I put in parentheses he pulled his dick out. I yeah, got, I got in trouble that. in fifth grade you for that. You got in trouble for that. I don't know. It was, no it was true. Can't drop a D bomb. I think that's what you call it. Uh, I think it's a D bomb. <laughs> okay. I do four D and B bombs. Uh, Bobby has a question for Johnny. Go ahead, Bobby. Oh. 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 How long has it been? Oh, God. This guy heard. And he's he snuck into your place before. Yep. Yeah. One of the I think that was on some of the old Fifty Seventh Street. Were you at Fifty Seventh Street too? Oh, he'll he never jumps, stay away yeah, because he, doesn't, he, doesn't stay he always worries that we're figuring out where he lives. Well, we know that he has he rents classic cars to uh, movies. So we know he's down to two separate places. Wait, wait how do you know that? Uh, because I've seen him around and okay. stuff, and he's come around. And he Well, he's told me on better nights. But then I've always invited him here, but he doesn't want to give his license because <laughs> he knows we right. will fuck with him at work. <laughs> because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to go. I used to have producers who cared. Well, the We're, first producers that you... Uh, I remember those guys um, and girls. Hana Han. Well, Earl's you stole, results. but she does produce results. Out of all, and I believe he was the he won the producer of the <laughs> decade <laughs> award is Billy Billy so Staples. Staples. Well, I believe he's out now. He did, I think, in a, a sweet six month bid, or <laughs> he's getting out soon. I think he takes. I got a LinkedIn request from him the other day. All right, so check with him. And see. Good picture. <laughs> yeah, really good shot. I think it was uh, a mugshot. Um. <laughs> But he used to call him at home and wake him up in the middle of the night and say, how do you fucking like it, motherfucker? I'm coming to where you live. You know, you would, I'll fucking beat your whole family with a claw hammer. Was he, I think, in Jersey, right? The guy? The, the yeah. Show, yeah, because it's, I think, didn't we, the night, the boxing night, I think, was right next to maybe possibly, we, we narrowed it down to one of the right. places where where he actually worked. He's been a uh, a 15-year crank caller, which <laughs> makes 
There's a closeness. Oh there. yeah, you yeah. have a relationship. He can't know? call me either nine eleven or nine twelve, <laughs> right. um, like, which is it's nothing sacred. But do you remember what that crew? I mean, they were the anti laid back crew. Like oh. they were like the show's the most important thing. The guests are most. You used to remember what it was yeah, like. There. Absolutely, you wouldn't have just wandered up the hall like you did today. Somebody would have greeted you at the door. Brought you in, had a beverage, a snack. But that's the way we were in those days. There was a carry that went around. There wouldn't have been a way that I signed into the guest book like I did. What did you write? <laughs> Fuck did my you, dick hole again? Is did that you draw it? a penis? Like, look who I'm coming to see at the bottom. Chris, I can't even read that. Chris Dick. Chris Dick. <laughs> yeah, that's not my name, Johnny. I thought it was. That's it's what I not. thought I heard him say. I mean, say I am a dick at times. He wrote Chris Dick. <laughs> well, he works no in another department. Checking. <laughs> He's checking. Okay, have a good day, Chris sir. Do you? Enjoy. Let me see that picture of Amy. Is that the only uh, picture of Amy? Is there more? There's more. Oh, that's, just her that's a Star beautiful Wars. photograph. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the lighting. Yoda. She could easily be the next Leia. I think uh, she could bring a. The, she's going to work on the buns on the side. But the normally side buns. everybody does. That's, <laughs> why didn't you show us these pictures <laughs> earlier? Wouldn't that be going? She's given the head cheek? to a lightsaber. I would think it would go through your cheek if you tried that. I don't. She's think, very I skilled. Think the, oh, oh God! That's she's in a on. menage there with the. Is she topless there? It looks like topless. <laughs> yeah, she's topless. Mm -hmm. There's a little lady get that's all of it. That's all of it. Beautiful. Well, we are doing the uh, Amy Schumer's train wreck takeover weekend. That's right. Starting Friday at noontime. Comedy DJs, you and I. We're going to comedy DJs. We're playing a lot of the old Unmasked. Uh, every comedian who's in the uh, show will be registered. We cut this late into the night last night. Mm -hmm. Why? Love. You, love for the listener. You are so the, much love. Uh, we had a, uh, a discussion about how you're the only show goes on vacation. What do you do? Give us fresh material because well, you love. We double down. Who are you having the discussion with? Myself. Okay. <laughs> That's scary for the club. That is scary. No, there was a couple of people actually. It was, it was more of a Twitter conversation. Okay, that, tweets. Mm -hmm. Tweets were loving the fact that you did that, and you always have done that, and it's because of love. You're right. I it's guess it's care. um. You know, because I know what it's like to be unloved. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? How do you know? Uh, the way I've treated women in the past. <laughs> I've treated my listeners much better than I've ever treated women. I think... I think I look for love in all the wrong places. I've always said that about you. Mm. You said about everyone, though. Yeah. I think everyone's looking for love in the wrong places. I look for love in the wrong places if you consider the wrong places to be prostitutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and here's why I like to be with prostitutes. A, you can pay them. Mm -hmm. So they're in the service industry. You're not there to please them, but service. And then B, if you feel the need to hit, <laughs> they don't normally call the police because they're prostitutes. Right. And they'd be arrested. That's kind of part of the thing. I yeah. thought you were going to say that they uh, that they don't expect service, but when they get it, I mean, if you feel the need to, you know, service, <laughs> service. them, yes. they're shocked and they're so grateful. Believe me, you go down on a prostitute, you deserve a medal. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I stand before you, not just a taker of prostitution, but yet a giver. <laughs> With my tongue, lips, mouth, <laughs> I gave. Not only vaginally, <laughs> but anally as well. Oh. Is this now a crime? The man's a saint. <laughs> if it's a crime, then it's a crime that should be punished with ice cream. <laughs> and Listerine. <laughs> Please. And fruit juices. Give the man some fruit juices for this. This is why I would like to be a lawyer, but I'd like to be one of those lawyers who wears a powdered wig. <laughs> I don't know where. Do the, they still have them in England, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think. Or at least the judges still do, right? I think everybody does. Everyone's Even, uh, rocking the powdered wig. If I was on the jury, I'd put on a powdered wig. <laughs> I want to be part of this Did whole thing. Well, next time we get jury called for jury duty, let's go in like that. <laughs> wearing a robe and the powdered wig. <laughs> 
I am here to do God's work <laughs> and judge these people as the Lord would. I take this service to my country very seriously. We're a family business. <laughs> this is my daughter, H.I. <laughs> She's deaf. Give me the blood, Lord. Get me out of here. She was a bastard in a basket. Bastard in a basket. He never was in a. Uh, was he never a bastard? Where did they yes. find him at? He was a bastard in a basket. In the opening scene, you see he's on the train with him, and he is in fact in a little basket. I got mixed up, and I thought they pulled him out of the well. I don't know. Remember, remember the dead body in the well? <laughs> yeah, the yeah. was not in the well. I thought they brought the child up. I really want to watch that movie again. Today. Yeah, there's a. I believe it might be the opening scene. But you see him sitting on the train, and there's is he a little oily. Though is the baby oily? It seems like <laughs> no. I can remember the baby being oily. <laughs> he mined that child. <laughs> this is why they won't let me vote at the Oscars. <laughs> <laughs> I vote for oil baby. <laughs> I liked it. The part I didn't understand is how the baby came from the oil. Was the oil representing cum? <laughs> like the earth's black cum? Because <laughs> if it is, then I liked it. I've actually had this debate to people. All right, after he beats the idiot in the fucking head and kills him, yes. right? Does he get away with it or does he go to jail? That's the question. I, I think he probably he didn't seem like he was in a position to hide that crime. I think well, he probably. But wouldn't. could he pay his way out of it? Uh, he like, did he really end up doing time? I felt he went to prison at the end of the movie. And yet we have nothing to prove that. No. No. I just didn't think it was going to end well for him. For having another violent. You enjoy you the violence. Give me a violent, violet. You like the violence? I don't like it, but I like feeling like I've... I had a thing when I was a kid where I used to go, I wonder what pool chop tastes like. <laughs> and now I know. It definitely seems like something that as a child you would have been like, what does this taste like? <laughs> this and then immediately, like, bad, bad, I should have done it. Just having that pool chalk thing. I'm going to put my tongue in the middle of it. And I was trying to put that pool chalk. It was not good. You're not supposed but to do that. Anything that smells slightly good when you're a kid, you want to taste. Yeah. And then out of everything in life, is there anything that brings back memories like smell? No. Like I could... Smell library paste right now, the old library paste. Yeah. I want to run out of my kindergarten the same way that I did the first time. The smell, the, most school supplies, the smell of markers or crayons, like the way they smell to oh. me. Remember that like, scene in, um, it was the first Cameron Crowe, Fast Times at Ridgemont yeah. High, where they're passing out the paper. <laughs> the the kids smell. Oh, yeah. No, those, um, those you guys printouts. were too young for a mimeograph. You I'm not. remember that? No, I think I had scan. Yeah, I had Scantron. Scantron know, but, is yeah. what I had, but <laughs> I had was told graph. that they they had a very specific odor. You could get high. It had a smell, smell that, like a marker, could kind of yeah. when you were a kid buckle your knees a bit. Right. <laughs> like you just smelled some turpentine. You're like a little high from it, and already, but like this is an enjoyable high. But it's <laughs> <high> <laughs> Do you see the Mister S- the new Mister Sketch marker commercial? Mm-hmm. Those are the ones that smell like fruit. And they say you always wonder how the how they get the scent for the Mr. Sketch markers and they show a little blueberry on a seat and he just kinda leans over and goes and just let that a little blueberry fart and the blueberry air goes up into this contraption and then they, they're saying that they trap fruit farts. And that's something that would obviously <laughs> kids would want that. Yes. Yeah. But it was now, good marketing. Did you were you ever the kind of kid you smelled something weird and you wanted and you in fact ate it, even though <laughs> did you do you ever have memories of well, eating. Well, I would reject food what, 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 the same way that we saw Chris do. Right. I did that so many times <laughs> on my dining room table when my parents would tell me something was right. good. And I just like, really liked, as soon as it would hit my mouth, be like, Bloom! you know, I'm <laughs> yeah. just dripping down. You and your brother never were Mm-mm. as bad as food as I was. But d- did you ever eat non-food items? Like, do you have a memory of being so young that you would have eaten something like chalk or glue or anything like that? I don't think so because my taste buds were so intense right. that if something were over salted, I couldn't handle it. You know what I mean? Like if anything were, if anything had a strong taste, it was too much for my little system to be able to deal with. <laughs> I remember I got um, 
toothpaste. It was, it was that old gel toothpaste with all the glitter oh, in yeah. it. Yeah. And um, I kept sneaking in the bathroom <laughs> eating and it? eating it. Yeah. And uh, I did get found out. <laughs> That's not good. <cool. laughs> and no. I wasn't enjoying it, but it's just, you know, when you're a kid and you're just like, That's a weird sensation. Like, I want to keep eating this yeah. weird stuff that isn't food. Fresh breath, though. I also think I might have eaten um, cat food once, <laughs> like dry cat food. Oh, oh, dry is not that bad. Dry. <laughs> no, I, they, I, I, most, I was, I was like toddler age though. But. Dry cat food's more like uh, you know, like a, a goldfish. As a, I think but white I remember, would be nasty stuff. I remember way, looking I at dry cat food and being like, I shouldn't have did this. I'm gonna try to hide this from the adults. What kind of parents <laughs> this did you, What kind of parents did you have? Parents that were doing other things. <laughs> That's all. First of all, she never got away with anything because she talks too much. Yeah. No. To get away with it. Guys, I need to tell you something that just happened to me. <laughs> just, I would always say this. Well, just don't puff on the burning end. <laughs> See, oh, <yeah. laughs> don't start shotgunning. <laughs> um, yeah, it is weird. Well, I mean, just imagine if there were babies on the planet without adults watching them, how many things that they would stick in their mouths. Kids love to put things directly into their mouth, which makes sense because, like I said, it's your most intense uh, taste. Yeah. And, you know, uh, uh, your sense, so you go to it. By the way, did you see the thing on the eye bang? I think it was yesterday. A little girl getting glasses for the first time. Too much to you handle. You will fucking cry like a baby. I did not see it. All right. Chris takes forever to get stuff, but he does eventually get it. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> Ew. So, first of all, I had just seen something on the person who invented these glasses because he gives them out to Mexican children. They come up with a very cheap way of making these glasses, uh, frames that won't break. Right. And now you see this baby is rocking the same exact glasses which is already adorable first of all there's nothing cuter than a baby uh to begin with but to see a baby in my opinion with elvis costello glasses right it's very stylish like yeah but it what you're looking at is somebody who has never seen correctly before. never seen correctly so only has seen the world fuzzy including her mother's face and face it, there's no way that she would know the difference. You know what I mean? Like, right. It would be like us suddenly getting another dimension. It would be like being able to see your mother's soul. And her first reaction, just like any baby, like, don't put that on me. Yeah, <laughs> I don't no. want to be touched. I right, watch this, Johnny. So here, what's the name of this, by the way, Chris? Uh, it, it, the name of it on the eye bang is, this is the coolest baby ever. Mm, that's a good one. <laughs> good name. <laughs> Now watch, she's trying to get the glasses off her. And Hi. the second Hi, How are you? The <laughs> joy. Wow. The joy that's in her face from beginning to really be able to see. It's stunning. It's so sweet. <laughs> the glasses are pretty cool. The glasses are they way look cool. great on her. I think she can. <laughs> she's amazed. But even when I was like a little kid, like in elementary school, and there would be kids with glasses. There was, there was a way almost of like thinking, "I wish I had glasses." Oh yeah, know? I had that, that same thing with um, kids with inhalers. <laughs> sure, <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, that's cool. like, give me a hit off that. It looks pretty cool. Um, there was this kid in my school, first grade, had glasses. Let me try to think of his name. Four eyes, mm -hmm. and I remember <laughs> mm -hmm. when we were all sitting around kicking and punching four eyes. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> thinking, you know what? Those glasses look great. You look like Bill. You look like Buddy Holly. Ooh, you. You know what? Give me those glasses. These are my glasses now. And give me your shoes. You can get them back if you put your shoes on and then your socks outside of those. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the worst thing ever? To ask to make a kid do that. Who does that? Was that a thing to do? I know one kid who had to do it, <laughs> and he had to put his socks outside his shoes, and he had to walk in the snow like that back. But you know why? Why? What's he doing with my girl, cute girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens. That's what happens. See, His socks are ruined around. now. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, you know. 
Hey, like we were saying with Parker Posey, sometimes it takes a movie to make you realize you acted awful. So, so true. We need yeah. to break one more time before the end of the show. Well, it's already the end of the show, so you're breaking for no reason, ain't you? Still with the break, but then before three. You're some producer today, Chris. Oh, it's, it's spectacular today. Today wasn't your day. Not at all. But you got made. That's a good thing. I don't like getting you. Maybe that's why people write you down as Chris Dick before they come in here. <laughs> I thought he said fish dicks, but it was Chris Dick. No. Fish dicks a whole That's what you're saying to Kanye. <laughs> We're back. Bennington. Johnny was just uh, giving us some of the air fresh in her gum. Uh, this I actually like. I can't believe it. Is that right? Yeah. What's the name of it? What are they called? 1930s gum? Chowards? <laughs> Chowards? Chuds? Chud. Chowards gum. I don't know why. I like the gum a lot more than the can. Uh, the candy I thought was awful. This is good. It tastes like clove cigarette. Johnny wanted to make a correction on a <clears throat> statement I made on the show the other night. I would never correct you because you're always right. But the story of Henry Hill was actually happened. That happened to me. So... Eddie was broadcasting at the across the street at the 888 building, which was on 57th Street, which is where you guys used to broadcast, right. as you know. And uh, he asked me to go downstairs one night to go pick up one Mr. Brett Michaels from Poison. So I go downstairs and there's this really dirty, scuzzy looking guy. And he's walking up to people and asking if they have a cigarette. And he comes up to me and this is pre double stapling. And he looks at me and goes, you got a cigarette, you fat fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, no. <laughs> like, so I'm waiting outside. It's kind of raining. Eddie calls me, says, come back upstairs. Brett's running late. Come back downstairs. Now the guy's downstairs and he's got a cigarette and he goes, you got a lighter, you fat fucking motherfucker. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I don't. You fucking jerk off. Why don't you go fuck yourself? And he goes, do you know who I am? I said, no, who are you? He goes, I'm Henry Hill. And my first thought is, no, you're just a crazy homeless guy. But then in the back of my head, I thought he was on Howard that morning and he was all fucked up. And I said, are, are you really Henry Hill? He goes, <laughs> yeah. I go, wow, that's really cool. So I went from wanting to kill the guy who's calling me a fat fuck to where he's saying it's really cool. And he said, he, I said, uh, here, I got a light. So I gave him a light. <laughs> and he goes, uh, hey, you got, uh, you got like, like 10 bucks or 20 bucks. He goes, I'll write you a check for a hundred dollars. If you give me 20 bucks, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 20 bucks. You sign me a check. You write void on it. Cause I want to have that thing. And I always keep it in my wallet because it's, it's a good story. And it's a good story to have a prop to. And there is the Henry Hill wow. signed, and it had his address, it had his phone number, and for the, every now and then I would call it, and it would be like, this is Henry, you know what to do. <laughs> and it was, and <laughs> that was my, my run-in with Henry Hill, and it turns out that later that night, that was when the Hard Rock was across the street, he went in and did the same thing at the Hard Rock, and he wrote a check to one of our bartenders for like a hundred bucks, and the bartender bought him a few beers. That's I don't know crazy. if he kept that the was check, his but, thing. but I kept the check, and because it was... Henry Hill, I went from wanting to hit the guy to wanting to hug him. Well, I uh, brought that up because he's always in a, uh, another weird thing. One minute after the next, another story came up. But you know the, do you know the little restaurant, Italian restaurant on Fifty Seventh Street that has the nose? Shot three yeah. yeah. So I'm in there one day, and I'm ordering food. And I'm like, this is fucking, guy's driving me crazy. My waiter, very short guy, he's driving me crazy. Finally fucking figured it out. He played young Joe Pesci in that movie. And he was <laughs> oh our God. waiter there, right? And you recognize him? I, I yeah. recognize him, yeah, because he was one of those guys that even when he was an adult, he didn't, he kind of looks the same. <laughs> he didn't exactly <laughs> mature the same way. And a lot of actors are that way. We're just looking at Parker Posey today. Yeah. You know what I mean? And her little body is just like pre breasts. So, you know what I mean? Like her, <laughs> she's, she's got a little girl's body. Yeah, she's very, she's very young looking. It's bizarre. Yeah. She looks the same as she did. But by know? the way, that guy wasn't exactly comfortable with me bringing up, <laughs> like, hey, you, you know, yeah. moving. And he goes, you in the business? No. 
No, I'm just... Ra- if radio the business, I'll be happy <laughs> to say... You I'm mean the radio, business. then, yes. I am in that business. Right. It's probably not what you consider the business. <laughs> I guess I'm in the worst part of the business. <laughs> Other than mimes? Well, I think he was in the worst part of the business. That's the actor who's the waiter. Yeah, but you know what? I give him all the credit in the world. I think he went and did some Sopranos or whatever. Well, you got to just keep going, you know? It's like yeah. I tell these kids today, like I was telling Joe, after you get fired here, you're going to catch <laughs> on to something. <laughs> after today's show, which guy goes out, Chris? Oh. Look, uh, at the, it's that inability to make the decision. Is it me? Like no, that. It's that inability to make Then the Dan gets fired today after today. Then today Dan gets fired. Today. You just said today. That's the decision. Today. Dan gets would get fired after oh, today. Based tomorrow. on anything or based on some guest handling. Mm. You keeping Joe or you letting them both go? The Joe would be on probation. Does Ant move up? Ant disappointed me today about something too. So what happened? he said he was gonna do something for me on Friday, but he hasn't done it yet. Blowjob? It was or, oral he sex. Shouldn't have now, to what do was that. It really? uh, he was, to, he was gonna write something up for him for the for the entire bang. I. Bring the whole Joe. Call your crew in together. Oh, so now they all want to come in here. I guess what? on their last day, instead of going into Joe. There's a mic in there, over. guys. Yeah. There's actually three mics in there now. All right. I guess it's the last day for Dan and <laughs> Aunt, which I can't believe. I guess we canceled the trip to Montreal for Dan. Um, so I, I yeah. actually emailed you the piece, so. After, after, but, after, but it's mm. there. Do you feel like he's not giving you the? Thing no, he was need? right. He was right. I should have did it over the weekend. But Dan, do you think that he's right? Uh, uh, Andy, as, as soon as it was brought right to Andy, he went right on. It felt bad that he didn't well, do it no earlier. Andy, Andy, Andy. Uh, I was, yeah, I was trying thing. to skip, the, gonna trying to skip the vowels. I'm not going to. I'm asking about you. Oh, what about now, you've got the look? Dan has uh, got the look of a guy who probably would strap. Fucking dynamite onto him, sorry. <laughs> right into the place. Like, if we were making a thing about a suicide bomber, I'd be like this. Who was that kid that came in earlier today? I'd like to, I'd like to take another look at him in a screen test. Is he yeah. right? What are you saying about you? Th- that I should be gone soon? Yeah. Well, I, I think that's a little unfair, but, you know. You think you're doing good? Uh, I mean, you know, I'm I'm very critical of myself always. So. I thought last week was Dan's week. You were getting material in the air, and you were sitting in here, and things oh, yeah. were happening. That was a good week. Yeah, yeah. and then beat the joke, which we're probably going to bring on to the show. It's been going great. Dan and Gail have been really. That's been a jokes of plenty. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Although that some of the talk has come up, are you cheating by sending five jokes? Should you be the one responsible for one joke? Well, I just I just wanted to give options, More so you just fire, why, you just fire yeah. out a bunch of them. Yeah, so He's a comedy you, writer. Here's the thing, and I'm not even kidding when I say this, Dan. I'm going to call one day and say, "Do you remember me?" Now that you have your own production company with <laughs> fucking eight shows, I honestly think he's going to be that big. I look at the that. stuff that he does, and it's amazing. That's very nice of you. But that doesn't mean that he's good at radio. No, Someone that's has very to... true. That's really, that's 100% but that, true. But there's a different thing. You would have to be trained. Would you guys, re- would it be better if you're out from under Chris's thumb and you're becomes a Joe world for you? Where you just answered to Joe? I, I think Chris has done a good a good job. Uh, training us, and when we've screwed that's up not, at times, that's on us being. That's not what I ask because yeah. th- this could be one of those things that works or doesn't work in your future. Because today he was ready to cut you loose. Would you rather be in a world where he cuts you loose than to be under Joe? I I see I see Joe is more a, a colleague, and I'm going to quote Andy. You 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 were saying this to me earlier. I don't fucking respect Joe in the okay. least. So Jesus. I think it was harsh. Yeah, but I think we have to take that into account. End quote. I know I'm taking it into account because I had big plans for Joe. I didn't agree with him. Uh, Joe, not a good day for you, dude. Today, not a good day. Okay. All right. Um. <laughs> so you're just a colleague to these guys. No, I like to think uh, we all do our own part around here. We That's all work true. really hard and that we all have our own dynamic going of who gets what in, 
I mean, even though we all do it, and I think we work well as a team together. Joe's great. Yeah, that fucked you up, Joe. Even you were a statement back about... And I mean, I think Hard Rock Johnny knows this. You've got over 4,000 people <laughs> under you at all times. I've never yes. seen you do anything but sit and eat, eat fucking apps with me. So I don't know what <laughs> your job is when I'm not there. Other than, you know, you bust balls with people as they walk by. <laughs> but you're always looking for leadership, am I right? Absolutely. Joe does isn't having a guy that the that the other guys respect and will follow. That fucks him up from a middle management point of view. I lead them every day. That's no, you true. just he, he, does. Does. he does. does. I just heard Dan throw you under the fucking bus <laughs> yeah. here and I know that, that you know, it might be a joke to you guys, but it isn't a joke to Don and me. Why we're looking to put this together and see how this stuff works. I think Joe uh does an insane amount of work and works incredibly hard. Sincerely. That doesn't make and, you a leader. That but, that might make you a thing that you go off and do things on your own, but it doesn't make you a leader. A leader is when you get the respect of your peers. That's leadership. That's something you can't buy. That's something that can only be earned. Personally, I think it's something that people are born with. We, I think, I, I respect Joe a lot, and I didn't, I didn't know him prior to starting here, but immediately got a lot of respect for Joe. You just said that you wouldn't follow him, and you see him as anything. I other. would follow him to the gates of hell. All right, so you see what I go through with this, the changing, the changing time. I'm trying to put something together that works for all of you guys. Chris wants to get rid of some of you. Who are you looking to get rid of? Dan was on the list today. Is he still on your list? Yeah, I'm going to have to talk to him after the show. No, I'm taking that thing away from you. This is what I'm going through. Okay. It isn't a matter of taking... By the way, if I'm taking, talking about it during the show, you fucking talk about it after the show doesn't bring anything to the thing. I'm just trying to put something together that works for everybody. Um, I don't know. I guess we can worry about it later. Johnny? We got to wrap this one up today, but this was thrilling to be in a, on the Bennington show. This was my first. Well, you know what? Live. You brought in these. I have an after uh, <laughs> thing, and there's this weird. It's almost like I, I on my mouth. It's like I sprayed <laughs> spider repellent in my mouth. It's terrible. Gail likes the gum. You like the gum? I like the gum. Where do, you, the where do you see the aftertaste you get from it? It's horrifying. Uh, we did not plug any of the unmasked and stuff like that that we have to do, but if you come to Montreal, make sure you go over and look at the eye bank. Then this Friday, uh, we start the train wreck weekend. That's it, everybody. We'll see you back in here in 1974. Ladies and gentlemen, the evening is over. We hope you all enjoyed yourselves, and we'll see you all again in 1974. Good evening! Yeah!